order at 6.05. Hello, everybody. Welcome back from summer. Why don't we just briefly go around the table and reintroduce ourselves so everybody knows who we are. Um, and then we can move on with some amendments that we have to the agenda as well. Tim? I'm uh, Tim Bishop. I'm uh, in Reading, representing Reading. Patty Kosmikas from Pomfret. Jim Half from Killington. Claire Drabitko from Woodstock. Pamela Fraser from Barnard. Ben Ford from Woodstock. Morgan Saylor from Plymouth. Bryce Samuel from Barnard. Adam Amling from Reading. Matthew Huff from Bridgewater. Melina Egan, Woodstock. Jen Flaster, Plymouth. Paige Hiller, Woodstock. Jennifer Gettin, Tony, Killington. Mary Beth Banjo, Superintendent. And we have Richard Seaman. Oh, you were oh, here. I'm Go sorry. ahead. Lewis County Woodstock. <laughs> Lewis County Woodstock. We have Richard here, who is our finance director. And we have Joe, who is our uh, buildings and grounds director. And yes. Sherry Souza, our special ed. And Garen, principal of the middle school, high school. Do we have any other people? No. Okay. So our amendment to the agenda is that we're going to have to just um, pull the Union Arena contract um, out of the consent agenda because there was a change that needed to be made and Richard needs to just present that change and then can we approve that? I would believe so, yes. Okay, very good. Um, it has also been requested since we are doing um, a Prosper Valley engineering report and kind of next steps and recommendations um, <coughs> that we hold the comments from the community till after the report so that if you have any questions regarding the report, we can address those questions if that's fair for all of you. That was one thing Bob had asked us to do, and I think, Patty, you're okay with that as well? Yeah, I'd ask for that, yep. Okay, great. Um, so if there's any other questions not related to the Prosper Valley report that we'll hear later on in the evening, please introduce your, stand up, introduce yourself, and you can tell us what you're here for. Um, I'm Anna. I'm from Reading. Hi, Anna. Um, thanks for having us back. And thank you for putting the questions after big, big uh, items on the agenda. That's super helpful. That's something we've requested previously. Um, I went into the middle school the last day of SOAP when we had the open luncheon, open house to collect our children on the last day of SOAP. Um, and went into the bathroom literally directly across the street, uh, across the hallway from the cafeteria and found no soap dispensers on any of the walls and only like single use hand sanitizer on the, sh on the counter. Um, and I wonder if that was something that is normal at the middle school and high school campus or if that's something that was like summer time break, rebuild the bathrooms, rejuvenate, um, or if there's a policy around having something other than hand sanitizer um, as an option for cleaning hands before eating lunch or just around the school. I honestly don't know what the answer is to that, but... We got Joe. Yeah. Joe? <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, I'm not quite sure either. There should be soap dispensers in there regardless. Um, okay. And usually mounted on the wall. It's summertime. We're doing a lot of projects. Maybe some of them will remove um, and not go back Okay, so this is not time. a normal thing? No. Okay, because no. I don't want to raise fire in our water. No. Okay. But I'll definitely look into it. Right I appreciate that. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Kristen from Reading. Um, I just wanted to ask some questions about an incident that happened this evening. Um, I wanted to know what the protocol was for the bus company, that my child was an hour late and I was frantic looking for my child and I couldn't find the bus number. I didn't know where he was, nobody's at school, which who's at school after five. Um, and I just didn't know with all the prompts when you call here, if maybe so nobody else was frantic, there could be like a bus number at the end that says, because you can't find anyone. And this is the second time it's happened to my child and I don't want it to happen again. Second time it's happened to your child this start of the year? Uh, being in this district. Being in the district. Mm -hmm. Mary Beth? What I'm gonna ask, could, Raina, could you collect your contact information? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna ask Raina to reach out to you in person tomorrow and make sure that we get your answer. Okay, because I know there's four other parents that probably will be fine. Okay. But if you can just be sure, be absolutely sure you see oh, yes. Terena over there in the blue shirt, and we will make sure you, you get a phone call tomorrow. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Anyone else? All right, we're going to move on. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, I just want to kind of refresh everybody's memory um, as to what's happened since our June meeting and kind of what our responsibilities are as a board. Um, one, our responsibility is to set policy um, within the district and we've got some really great policies that have been approved over the last six months um, and I can't thank the policy committee enough for the hard work that they've put forth in, in getting the wording corrected and working hard with our administrators and our administrators working hard with our policy committee so thank you thank you all of you for the really hard work that went on from June to July to August on, on some little things that needed to be adjusted. Um, two, we're also responsible for creating a budget that is fiscally responsible to our taxpayers. Um, and Jennifer and the Finance Committee will start working with Mary Beth and Richard and Mike, our new finance director, to start putting that together probably October, November will be the time period that we start the process. Um, we've also taken into account some people's comments about past processes and could we change some things in the, in the communication basis of it and so we've taken that into account. Um, and then three, within that budget that is then approved by our taxpayers and handed off to our superintendent, we are to provide the best education to all of our students within the entire district. So those are our three main uh, responsibilities as board members, as well as overseeing the superintendent's office. Um, so I just wanted to kind of reiterate that. Um, also, I wanted to kind of reiterate that last June, we had a really great productive meeting. Um, we approved our portrait of a graduate our five-year strategic plan, which is the first five-year strategic plan I think we've had, at least in Jennifer's and my 15-year history, so that was a huge accomplishment for all involved, um, as well as our 1920 strategic plan goals to move us forward this year. And we also voted to endorse us looking at um, the financial feasibility of a district-wide facility improvement plan. So um, Jennifer and I will be talking to Richard and our new finance director and Mary Beth this week um, about initial numbers and how, those, how that finance plan could possibly break down and we'll report to you in either our next meeting or our early October meeting about the initial numbers and how that looks for us. Um, other than that, um, the big hire for the summer was our finance director and unfortunately Mike couldn't be with us tonight but <coughs> his first day was today and Mary Beth said that it was very successful. Um, Richard got to sit down with him for a little bit this afternoon as well and we'll be working with him until he leaves on October 1st. Um, so I think that's about it for me and we'll move forward from there Mary Beth. Um, so one of the things that you had mentioned is our strategic plan. So board members, you have a copy of the final published version that you voted in June. Um, this will be available to the community online um, at our website. Uh, community members will also be getting a um, abbreviated mail or that gives you information about the goals, the portrait of a graduate, and the process that we went through. Um, so folks can be looking forward to receiving that in the mail. Um, so, and as you said, Paige, this is a, a really critical driver for our work ahead. Um, in the superintendent's report, we, we have our enrollment data. Um, one of the things I would offer to the board is that 
the state often looks at October 1 enrollment as being the, the critical number because so much is fluctuating right now in and out. So we have these numbers. Um, I anticipate there may be some shifts back and forth um, as as we, we kind of clear our um, system and make sure that we've that everybody reported <coughs> accurately. Um, but in general, we're, we're up a little bit from last year, um, and you can see the data in the schools. I'd like to give it another month before it's, uh, and say that this is really solid, just given all the ins and outs that often happen at the beginning of the school year. Um, I wanted to share with the board that um, overall I was really disappointed to hear of your experience with the bus um, today. So that will be something that we have, you know, absolutely want to address and make sure that we get taken care of. Um, in general, the feedback has been positive about the um, transition from Reading. Um, our students in grades four through six seem to have comfortably adjusted, and I'm sure that will continue over time, um, but it, overall that, that seemed to go relatively smoothly and parents had an, an opportunity to, to visit the school with their students before the start of school. Um, so I wanted to update you on that critical change that was made this year. Um, a couple of <coughs> other notes that I, and if I could just have um, Sherry speak to some of the work that you've been doing in terms of securing grant funds. We have some <coughs> exciting yeah. news in that front and the support from our community partners. Right. Out of Health Foundation, which is a really important group in our community, came to Mary Beth and I, yeah. I think last May, with a proposal on working on, on offering some resources around social emotional learning in the district. <clears throat> they have put together a proposal for over $100,000 that we will be the beneficiary of, including working with a regional uh, trauma expert to look at how do we work with children and families that have had those experiences, um, bringing other counseling resources into the building, offer training and learning opportunities for parents and community members. Um, so that was a huge bonus for us. Um, we'll have a district-wide training, we'll have a graduate level course happening. So it's a really large package. It's giving us a lot of resources. You know, I was one of the people that saw some of the requests that the, our counseling department asked for in the last budget round that we really didn't have the capacity to meet. These resources are really adding to what we can offer within our pre-K to 12 counseling. Another relationship that we've really been developing is our with um, HCRS, which is our mental health um, group support uh, catchment area for them. And they've developed and offered a therapist counselor to be available to high school and middle school students one day a week. You know, we, that really allows us to make connections for families that wouldn't otherwise be able to offer that and to bring them into our own community. So that's been really exciting. And again, Mount Scutney Hospital has been a long-term partner and has really offered us some amazing resources. So it's really exciting. It's great to see people coming to us and saying, here's an opportunity. How does it match with your goals, strategic plan, and really fitting nicely. So it's exciting. So it's not necessarily adding any additional um, employees, it's just, it's training employees that we already have. So it's consultation, so the Dr. Dave Melnick will be available for consultation, uh, consultation with the counseling team and other teams. We will have an additional person in the building one day a week, <coughs> who will be working with um, looking at students' dependency on digital devices. Middle and high school. Middle and high school, so he'll be with us for one day a week, really helping faculty, students, parents, around that you know relationship building and how our phone has become our new relationship and best friend and how do we have real relationships and connect with others. You know, friends, family, community, so that will be more in person extra month, uh, per week, as well as the clinician will be one day a week in district for most of high school. So, these are additional people, resources, each week mm -hmm. that we are not absorbing the cost on other agencies. Okay. Um, and then just again, Paige, I wanted yep. to um, reiterate and thank um, Richard Seaman, who is, is over in the corner there. Um, as, as you mentioned, Richard will be moving on as of October 1st to uh, work in his hometown. So he'll have a slightly shorter commute <laughs> um, and can continue the good work. I, I would like to publicly recognize and thank Richard for his service to the district.
five years. We've had some interesting budgets as we've merged, and I've uh, appreciated his, his support and, uh, and direction during that time. Um, we are, are pleased to share, as you mentioned, that Michael Concessi um, will be uh, the new Director of Finance and Operations. He started today, so we will have a three-week um, transition time where he'll be working closely with Richard to familiarize himself with our, our systems and also working with a Vermont mentor who spe specializes in school finance. Um, Mike is coming out of the private sector. Um, and we are um, very, very pleased to welcome him aboard, um, and he will um, be shortly attending these meetings in Richard's stead. So I um, just wanted to give a little bit more information on that. Good. Um, so can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda that includes the approval of the minutes from July 8th, June 18th, and June 10th? So to ratify the summer hires, to accept the resignation from Richard, and to ratify the Director of Finance and Operations. So moved. Second. 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 Thank you. Do you have that right? Mm -hmm. um, does anybody have any questions? Terry, can I just ask a question about how will families be aware of those services now being available? Um, you know, will, I mean, obviously, Families would get directed to them through um, the, you know, the administration or teachers or whatever. But if they felt that they had a need for something like that, how would we know that families are aware that these things exist? So the training and the, and the, the um, sessions that are offering after school will be on the website and going out in each of the emails. We're working with, uh, we met this morning with members of the counseling team identifying who and when. And so I think mostly it will be personal contacts because of the range and kinds of services. Um, I think that the, our counseling team really knows our families well in community, and um, I, and I think that eventually we will have some brochures and some descriptions that we can send out. But we're really looking at how do we utilize these resources that best fits our needs. We don't want a package deal. We want it specific to our communities, our families, what makes sense for students. <laughs> thank you. But thank you. Any other questions regarding the consent agenda? All those in favor of the motion on the table, say aye. 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 All those opposed, the ayes have it. Consent agenda has passed. Richard, why don't you um, talk through the Indian Arena management contract? The, um, <coughs> this contract is, as you saw, it's, it's a group that manages the Indian Arena, and their board got together to review this contract. And, we had made a change in addition to it, was, which was called a no-cause termination. Because the building is, in effect, owned by the school board, if the school board decides for some reason it needs to utilize the building to make changes, it should have the ability to do so. The uh, board of the, of the Union Arena Management Company asked that to be um, some additional language put into that, which basically said, if a notice of termination is given, service provider may ask to address the issue with the board of directors and explain the service provider's perspective or action if an opportunity to address the board is requested time on an upcoming agenda shall be set aside for the purpose the board shall then determine whether to determine whether to terminate the contract is in its best interest so it's really just an opportunity for them if there's a need to do this no cause termination to come in front of the board make their point known and then the board can take action after that that's the only change that was requested, and uh, we reviewed it with council and reviewed it with them, but it would be reasonable to add to it. Aside from that, recommend that we approve this contract. Hey, Jim. So on the notification, if for some strange reason we say we want to shut down the building for <coughs> educational use or whatever, right? is there, I don't see in the contract saying a given amount of time. Well, if we do a no, yes, it's it's paragraph P, okay. and um, <coughs> that we have the right to re to terminate the management agreement for its convenience, being the board for its convenience, at any time by giving 45 days written notice. If within that period they request to have a opportunity to talk to the board, they have that opportunity to do so. Yeah, that, that seems that seems pretty short. Well, yeah. I mean, 45 days be up and out. They didn't have an issue with the 45 days. They just wanted an opportunity to say either there's an agreement or disagreement. 
Okay. As long as they're good with it, they're 45 days be up and out. Richard, I've taken the contract to mean that they get their income based on operations of the arena? That is correct. Okay, do they take everything or is there a split agreement? Uh, there's no split and basically it's a balanced budget. Okay. And it's always right to that dollar. Okay. And anything that they have left over is pushed right back into the arena. So it's very specific to the union arena. It's not It's not being moved elsewhere. The, the, the union arena has a um, fund balance that's kept on hand. They do. And there are, and it, it's over a half a million dollars. And that and fund balance is managed basically here by the board. So if they're looking to get a payout from that fund, if they come to the board with a request for the payout to do capital improvements. And they do give scholarships out, am I correct I'm on not that? Aware that I believe they do give out no, some scholarships out of. I don't think they, do. they don't? No, no not from that one, Jim. That's, okay. a different, that's a different one specific to the high school. Okay. And um, do. Do you have any idea of how often they have come to us in the recent, say, five years for help and some extra funding? I know it's been a twice. couple times, right? Once or twice at the time. Twice. Twice. Twice, yeah, in, twice in seven years. That's what I thought. Once was, once was a real question. The other one was more of backing them on their solar efficiency, energy, whatever, right. and, and their fundraiser. So I wouldn't call that. They, they have been in front of us twice, between middle school, high school, yeah. board, and here. Okay. And there's no money in our budget for the union. Right. It's right. Like free no. operating. Any of the, uh, any the times the funds that they have asked have been from the funds that they have on hand, and, and the previous boards have never let it go below that half a million dollars. So it grows over time, and then they might come and say, we need $40,000 for X, and you just take a look at what they have, and it Sometimes it's been six hundred thousand. As long as they keep that five hundred thousand, we pretty much have been allowing yeah. it. Yep. Okay. So, do I have any other questions? Okay. Um, do I have a motion to approve the Union Arena management contract, please? So moved. Who's then? Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Those of all in favor of the motion on the table, say aye. 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 As opposed. <coughs> um, we're going to move on to time schedule appointments. We'll start with the summer program report. Thank you. So um, when the students leave at the end of the school year, um, the district is continuing to operate in a number of different levels and we want to just make sure that the board is aware of some of the things that happen over the course of the summer. Um, so when you, in your packet you have reports from each of the four areas that are highlighted here. And I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about our summer soap program. Many of you are familiar with that, may have had students or your children participate in it. But Sherry, I um, want to offer a couple of words about summer shelter. So this year we had about 160 students here each day. Um, we offer about between 16 and 20 different activities. What I think about that is unique and what I hear from parents about summer soap is that all of the people who work there are licensed teachers or paraeducators. So it's a highly trained group and it's competitive to work at Summer Soak. You write a proposal in December that's reviewed by the directors and then approved and um, reviewed. So we really want to make sure that we are about, um, we don't want students to regress academically. So we want them engaged in really active social learning play. Um, we, we have reading every day, they have a silent reading block every day. There's writing in all different facets from the, the sessions that are offered for our youngest students right up through middle school. Summer Soap is funded through a combination of grants, the Byrne Foundation, Hypertherm, Mascoma Bank. We have four different group community groups come together right in the beginning of June to offer $5,000 worth of scholarship money to ensure that there's no obstacles for students to participate. We provide transportation from all over the district. Students come on the bus. We don't go to every house, but we have stops along the way to get them here. We offer breakfast and lunch and snack. We have um, a lot of different programs this year. We offered an uh, equine group where um, one of the staff members brought in their horse a couple times over the summer. We had a Harry Potter group. Um, our middle schoolers are really involved in what we call counselors and training, where they come in for those four weeks and they work alongside the faculty in providing supervision and um, adding to activities. It's a really fun way. They also design what we call our water park. We put about, I don't know, 300 foot of plastic in the backyard with sprinklers and dish soap, and the kids create their own water park. And it's really 150 kids running around covered in bubbles. It's pretty much fun. 
So that's one of the activities. And we want activities that are just easy, simple, fun. We also have a water balloon fight and barbecue for our last event where we have about 3,000 water balloons and it's everyone gets soaked. Um, we do do one day, we call it our Inspire Day, Mascoma Bank supports that day, where we put 160 kids in buses and we take them far away from here. And so this year we did the Dr. Seuss Museum at Springfield Museums in Springfield, Massachusetts. We took them to the Lost River Gorge up in Woodstock, New Hampshire, and we took them to the Jay Peak Water Park. And so for six, seven hours, we are out of here and we, we really give kids an opportunity to leave their communities and do something vastly different. So we do that in the second week of our program and that's called our Inspire Day. And kids reflect on what about inspired you? What was new, what was exciting? Their conversations about Dr. Seuss and, and, and walking through the caves of the Lost River is really a, a great time. So we, it is all funded through grants Medicaid reimbursement money, as well as registration. So there is no cost to the taxpayer other than use of this building. Um, we have a great team. It's a pretty exhausting four weeks. People have talked about expanding it. There's no way. By the, <laughs> here are some instructors who were here. By that last Friday, we are crawling out of here and we're walking up and out of here by four o'clock on that Friday afternoon. So um, it's, it, I think it's a great opportunity for a community. I know it's very affordable for families and we know what kids are doing for that one month and we send them home exhausted at the end of each day. So we think we better than that. We also do a comparison, just one little like, at the beginning. And so in June, we all our students are assessed with STAR data. We then compare those STAR data for kids who participated in SOAK and those who didn't to the STAR data in the fall. So we really are very focused around that academic regression piece. So as we select proposals, as we look at what um, teachers are doing with the students, we really use that data piece um, to help identify what our programs should be for the next year. So it really is an accountability part of this. I just have a question. Sure. Was the um, enrollment similar to the previous year or is it was it more and and was the uh, programming the same or was there more we had up to our first year i think we had over 200 that was too much uh -huh. um we were at 190 for a couple so this is our sixth year so this was one of our lower years i think we've really partnered with other summer programs we do a summer camp fair in spring we really don't want to compete we just want to make sure kids are in healthy summer programs and so other groups have d taken on and offered more activities we don't want to compete with that's not our job our job is to make sure anyone who in this district <coughs> and and from districts outside we have kids who come from um from overseas the middle east to come here because they went once and they come every summer so um, we offered our district so that's when we know we've, we've hit our sweet spot yep. is like you know the excitement that we have kids enrolling so it's a little less but that's okay yeah. and we, we cut some positions as a result of the lower enrollment so we're, we're fine numbers wise Mary Beth, you want to talk about the new move? Yeah, but, but I, I kind of talk about the thank new you. innovation. Thank, oh, thank, thank you, Sherry. You're welcome. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I have to talk fast before I get the phone down. <laughs> Trying to keep us on yeah. schedule. <laughs> Just uh, two pieces here that I would put under the, the heading of professional development. As we had talked about, one of the things that we're able to do with the new um, studio is to offer professional development for educators this year. So we, we had a total of six teachers that, that came in, generated about $8,000 worth of revenue for the district. Um, and uh, not only the revenue, but the the teachers that came were uh, very, very impressed with the work that we were doing here and the kinds of things that the studio offers for students. Um, then um, another course that we offered, one of our key strategies that we're looking at for this year and is embedded in our strategic plan is to really look at improving our, our math outcomes. So we had 20 teachers um, that took a four-day course designed um, to address the needs of struggling math students. This was a course that our teachers had identified as being particularly valuable. Um, and you know, as, as, it, as indicated here, there's even a wait list for this course. We'll be offering a second graduate course this fall, um, but we had many teachers that took their summer time and really committed to looking at this particular group of kids. And these were all in district? 
the, uh, both of these were in district, yes. No, but the top one says there were four out of district. The, the oh, I'm sorry, no. I, I, oh, and the, under the new view? Oh, oh okay. yes. Oh, okay. yeah. So everybody that was in the math class was in district? Was in district. The okay. new view had some out of district gotcha. and some in district. And, and the math for all learners, that was K through 12 that was, teachers? Yeah, it was a strategy for working with students that um, had difficulty in math. Okay. And, and how are, what are some structures and ways of addressing their challenges and some of the common places that kids have difficulty. Um, and then finally, while well, we've got programming <coughs> coming on, this is this is a really critical time of year to address our facilities and to get some larger projects done. Um, so, Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the work that was done this summer? Sure. Uh, <coughs> sometimes uh, our time to shine is when uh, nobody's around and we can get a lot of work done. So uh, what we usually do is go through everything at deep cleaning. I think uh, this summer we threw out uh, about 240 yards worth of material that we've gleaned from the schools. Um, I'll just hit on a few little things at, at each school. Um, Barnard Academy was able to finish up some projects that they had going. We did some interior painting there. Uh, their exterior painting is being finished up right now. We did a little work to their septic system. Um, and their kitchen was uh, completed this summer as well. Up at Killington Elementary, uh, we did some interior and exterior painting. We also did uh, some drainage work uh, behind the school. We widened the back of the school so we'd be able to get some uh, snow machinery back there and remove the snow. We always have issues with snow blocking emergency exits back there. Um, Reading Elementary School, or I'm sorry, Reading Elementary School, uh, we did some interior and exterior painting there as well. We did some improvements to the playground and uh, we also repaired some rotting trim that was on that school. Woodstock Elementary, uh, we replaced the new fire detection and response system. We have an updated system in there that uh, was way past due and it was time for a new one. Um, we built some new classroom and office space up on the uh, second floor and we soundproofed the music room there as well. We also increased some playground safety by upgrading some of the stuff there and removing a few of the elements in the playground. Here at the high school, um, we uh, got a new sign. I don't know if anybody saw a new sign on our way in. We got the sign up and working again. Uh, we got the irrigation system up and working again, so all the fields now are being irrigated and overseeded. Um, we did some air conditioning in the uh, STEM lab now. Uh, we didn't have air conditioning in there, and in the summertime when we were holding these classes, uh, it got pretty hot in there, so we were able to do some air conditioning. And um, we also did some work in our basement. We had some problems with some uh, waste lines and we replaced about 120 feet of waste line down there. Um, and again, these are just a few highlights. There was a lot more that was done in the school, but uh, for the most part, uh, the doors open, lights were on, and everybody was happy. Thank you. And if, if I can just um, express my thanks on behalf of the district, Joe has a Joe and his team have been nothing short of remarkable in terms of getting a lot of work done, making sure that the buildings are ready to open. Um, I know there were countless extra hours put in, people using their own trucks to move things that needed to be moved. And um, I can't say enough about what Joe has brought to our district <coughs> and the team that he works with. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, on to our athletic director's presentation. I know he was there he is. Thank you. Hello. Why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, to those in the community who don't know me, I'm Karan Pinkney. I'm proud to uh, serve as your athletic director for Woodstock Union High School and Middle School. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, what I've done in my first year here, going into year two, and um, <coughs> talk a little bit about the direction that we're looking to take the athletic department. Paige, while we're doing that, yes. can we make a comment on the last item? So we yes. have 20 math teachers taking their own time to in essence work on professional development over the summer. Yes. I think that's quite remarkable. Um, so one of the things that we did in our contract is that Mary Beth came up with a programming that was accepted mm -hmm. by the state level for having credits accepted within <coughs> an in-district um, 
classes or improvement classes or development development thank you professional <laughs> development. who taught this Math and problems. and so it's been really yeah. beneficial yeah. because then we can strategically teach to kind of our goals and strategic <coughs> plan as well as helping our teachers improve their skill sets within their classrooms um, so that was something that was approved in our new um, in contract the, as well as approved by the state to accept those credits Correct. Yes, the, it was. This okay. particular offering just, it does not <coughs> fall under that. We're oh, working. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> 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 I wish I could say that we're able well, to. <laughs> so, you know, um, yeah. you know, the, the point is still the same, right? The fact that the 20 yeah. math teachers or 20 teachers showing up to improve their math skills, I think, is important, you know, given where our scores are and the work we need to do. I mean, I think it's great that that's happening. So, I applaud them for doing it. Yeah. And, you know, I'd also offer we, we probably had about. 10 to 12 teachers this week meeting on their own time, working at, you know, where, where are we in math, what's working well, where are our challenges. So I, the commitment of the teachers to really work on the, this issue is, is remarkable. Um, and also related to that is the, the course itself was brought to us by a team of teachers that said, you know, we've looked at this, we've taken this, we've found this to be really valuable, we want to bring this to our colleagues. And um, clearly it was, it, it was what teachers wanted because of the turnout that we had. Um, so I, not only is people coming in to take the course, but teachers really need to be credited for getting this, this course together here in the district. Nice job. Thanks, Lou. Okay, you're on. Okay. <laughs> so when we talk about the direction of the athletic department, you know, what does that mean? You know, we want to hit on the core values of what we're looking for. So the concept of a student athlete, what does that mean? You know, making sure they're not only getting the opportunities, you know, on the in the athletic arena, but also are they are we making sure they're doing what they're doing, they need to be doing in the classroom. Uh, providing demanding for rewarding programming opportunities for students to compete at the highest level possible. Honoring of diversity and inclusion, making sure we have programs available to all of our student athletes. Uh, focus on growth and development and attention to health and wellness. And when we talk about the program vision, you know, I, I wanna raise the bar for what we expect from our student athletes, not just, again, in the athletic arena, but also in the classroom. You know, we talk about portrait of a graduate and things like that, and we want to make sure we're in alignment with everybody's mission in the community. Uh, maintaining that proper balance between academics and athletics <coughs> to ensure that our student athletes are in the best possible positions for success. Um, working on building leaders for the future through an athletic leadership council that I founded last year, and I'm, I'm very, very excited about it. And very excited to try to take the next leap with uh, our new set of captains and students that have shown um, great leadership in our community thus far since I've been a part of it. Um, developing well-rounded students through that and also by encouraging multi-sport athlete participation. Uh, well-rounded students are a great way for you know our students to get into college so doing multiple things you know playing multiple sports being in the community, you know, being involved in some community initiatives, things like that, to make sure that our students are, you know, being accepted to the colleges of their choice. Um, collaborating with you guys, the board, you know, our administrators, our community members on improved facilities. You know, we have some schools in, the, you know, in the general region that, you know, they're a little bit ahead of us right now, but we have a goal in mind and you know plan in place hopefully that gets approved that you know we can catch up and, and be a part of that arms race um, and ultimately building Woodstock into that premier destination school in our region you know we talk about expectations increasing the academic standards um, you know having that model books before ball you know students first number one priority is in the classroom um, you know, participation in athletics and activities are a privilege at the end of the day, not a right, um, but we still want to provide those opportunities for them. Uh, fostering that maximum effort, not just, again, in the athletic arena, but in the classroom and in the community, being a part of those community initiatives. 
and ultimately understanding that there are consequences for poor behavior and poor, poor results in the classroom. Um, one initiative that we put in place last year was our Green Sheets procedure. Um, it's a weekly progress report um, where students collect, their, collect the sheets on Wednesday mornings. They hand them in to the Dean of Students or the Assistant Dean of Students by Friday at noon. And it's a weekly progress report that has allowed teachers to build those connections with our students and also quite frankly trying to learn you know as many students as possible in my first couple years here it allows me an opportunity to establish a rapport with them as well too putting a face to the name when they're handing in those green sheets and making sure they're on top of things so you know i feel comfortable reaching out to one of those captains in the hallway saying hey you got a few guys on your team <laughs> that still don't have their green sheets in make sure you're reaching out to them and, and buddying up and make sure they're doing what they need to do and getting those sheets in on time you know and what the green sheets initiative has done just in one year alone so far you know by raising the bar academically it's created that culture of expectation that we're looking <coughs> to build here um, it's uh, we've created a positive routine for our students so what that's done is created cohesion and it's teaching valuable life skills, you know, meeting deadlines, accountability, responsibility for your actions and, you know, holding yourselves accountable in the classroom, making sure your grades are on point so that you are eligible to participate. Um, creating that dialogue and fostering that academic support. Again, as I mentioned, you know, it's built, it's built that connection between our students and our teachers and established that rapport with our administrators. Um, it's created those leadership opportunities, again, with our captains where they've really taken the lead and you know they'll go to our dean of students on their own and you know, on Friday afternoon you know and say hey who doesn't have their green sheet in she gives them the list of names they go find those students those green sheets get done and keeping students on track academically you know is the most important piece of this um, and what it has done is increased academic performance and limited you know the decreased time in the athletic arena so students are <laughs> essentially missing less time in the athletic arena <laughs> <coughs> talking a little bit about our athletic leadership council um, I felt this was very important as, as an opportunity to kind of transform the culture of our athletic department and take us to heights that we haven't been before um, by providing leadership training equity and education in our students so that they're prepared not only in the athletic arena but in the community and essentially any facet of life hopefully that's the goal that we're, we're setting them up for long-term success um, you know with this leadership council I've seen a drastic change in re reinvigorating our school spirit students wanting to be more involved because they have more of a voice to uh, voice those opinions and you know they feel comfortable because we've established a rapport coming to me saying hey Q you know I think this would be a great idea and I can run it by my superiors and run it by you guys and we can work towards implementing some great initiatives on campus um, also building a strong sense of community and unity uh, and focusing again on the health and wellness activism and diversity and inclusion sportsmanship among other strong traits we look for in our student athletes um, getting into to a little bit of the sports participation piece um, we have a, obviously a range of sports that we offer at you know all three seasons at the high school and the middle school level and we have healthy numbers across the board um, in athletic participation and you know there's really no way to tell from year to year you know who's going to participate in what you know a prime example this year we have 21 students on the golf team you know so that's a 10 student increase <laughs> you know from the previous year you know and football is a little bit down because we lost 12 seniors plus we had another guy move out of state last year and we have another student <coughs> in the early admissions college program so when you talk about you know 14 kids from a team that only had 32 you know you got you got a smaller smaller team this time around and these are just a couple graphics as you'll see the fall sports for high school just kind of illustrates a little bit of where we are with the participation you know for the last three academic years 2017 to 2019 for the fall seasons 
here we have an illustration for the middle school participation. Again, same thing in the fall, fall season. And as we get into the winter, you we know, kind of see the same thing. We have some healthy numbers in many of our sports. And you'll see the middle school looks a little bit different because we only offer basketball at the middle school level officially. So you'll only see a couple programs there. And as we head to the spring, kind of the same thing. You'll see that jolt in numbers. Same thing in the middle school. Now essentially what all this means currently with the five, about 520 students that we have currently enrolled in the school this year, we're at about a 55% athletic participation rate across the board at the high school and middle school level. So what does that mean for our athletic budget? Currently, our adopted budget is $476,990. Now, my goal is obviously to tighten that up a little bit. Um, you know, it is a pretty healthy budget, but we do offer a lot of programs. So, you know, with that being said, you know, that number may seem a little bit alarming, a little bit big, but, you know, we do have teams that, you know, there's no team that I can say is over-resourced, you know, so. If anything, there are a couple teams that could utilize a little bit more. You know, prime example, snowboarding has been a varsity sanctioned sport over the past several years. We don't have a budget line for them. You know, um, ice hockey, ice time costs $25,000. We budget $500 for each team, the boys and the girls ice hockey team. You know, so costs like that, we gotta take into consideration and understand that again that number may seem a little bit alarming but sports are expensive sports are expensive so q is that four hundred and seventy six thousand dollars is that the budgeted number that we have yes is that, your roll call? that is the budgeted number we have that's the adopted budget for the 2019-2020 fiscal year you know and i and here's a, uh, an illustration of a pie chart, just kind of where that money is allocated. Now, personally, I think that, you know, there's plenty of opportunity to reallocate some of those funds to drive them back into our athletic programs. Um, you know, football gets a little bit more money because it costs more. When you talk about reconditioning equipment, make sure, making sure, you know, the safe, you know, the safety of it all, you know, safe and security for our students. Um, but most of our other sports get $1,100, and that $1,100 is stretched pretty thin when you talk about trying to have a varsity level team, a JV level team, and a middle school team that you're trying to support for each program. So I think we should take that into consideration. What does that $1,100 cover here? Say that again. But that eleven hundred dollars is intended to cover what? That's intended to cover equipment, supplies, you know, kind of whatever we can get. If a if a team needs uniforms that year, we got to try to stretch it out somehow, you know. And I know, you know, there is some concern about some of our athletic programs, you know, n you know, with the equity piece and trying to make sure we have uniforms for everybody. And that is one of my goals. We have had a couple teams that have gotten new uniforms right before I started, you know, but my goal is to make sure that all of our teams are outfitted in, in brand new gear and hopefully trying to get them on the same cycle so that I can come to you guys and say, hey, you know, four or five years down the road, hopefully the uniforms last that long where I can say, hey, you know, you may see a, a jolt in the, in the amount of money that we need because, you know, uni it's uniform time and we got to get our students outfitted. So the backup on Lou's question there is actually the budget was adopted for 476,990. Yes. Which is on page 34. Yes. And your actual is on page 35 of 446. Yeah. 446. So 46, that's 466. The correct? 446 is from last year's 
adopted it. Okay. Well, this year says adopted 1819, and it says actual. So it got adopted for 1819. You meant 1920. Can I see that for once? Sure. When I look at that, I look at it as saying that was adopted for 1819. No, so I have it at the top. It just didn't okay. skate over to the next okay. page there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So when you look at actually when you look at those numbers from last year, our adopted budget was four hundred and forty six thousand dollars, but we spent about four hundred and twenty five, four hundred and twenty six. So there is room in that budget to where we can reallocate those funds that I was talking about in and drive it right back into our athletic programs maybe boosting some of those sports lines up a little bit so our students are benefiting a little bit more from that. And lastly, I, I did a little bit of a, a little SWOT analysis um, and just talking, talking about the strengths. Obviously, we have amazing students, you know, in our program that deserve the world. Um, you know, the history of our programs. We have strong programs. You know, we want to continue to make sure that they're thriving. Um, I think we have great coaches in place. I have a couple more coaches that I need to hire, and I'm very excited about that process as well, too. I think whoever is hired is going to be another strong, qualified candidate. Um, and recruitable talent from our students, whether they're looking to play at the collegiate level or looking to go to some of the top-notch, you know, colleges and universities, we can get them there you know, as long as we're doing what we need to do for them. And we have a great town and a great community that's very involved that want to see our programs continue to thrive as well, too. Um, you know, you talk about the weaknesses, you know, some of the things we obviously can't control are geographic location. Uh, facilities, I'm hoping, you know, doesn't stay on the weakness page. You know, I'm hoping we can get that squared away. Um, organizational chart. Just making sure we're continuing to go in the right direction of trending upward. Uh, marketing and sponsorships, which is uh, something I would definitely like to work on. And then the uh, low morale, the school spirit piece, just continuing to build that up, again, through initiatives with the Athletic Leadership Council and um, you know, other community initiatives as well. You know, but we have plenty of opportunity with that being said. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the portrait of a graduate, you know, making sure we're aligned with that. Um, our revamped mission, vision, and philosophy statement, which you can all view on the, uh, our new athletics website. Um, the number of sports and recreational opportunities we provide for our student athletes. Um, that helps to uh, build, you know, and mold well-rounded students. Uh, and the Woodstock Recreation Department is huge to have right in town because that's part of the future. That's what will continue to drive our programs and continue to help them thrive. Um, the Athletic Leadership Council, you know, opportunities to upgrade our facilities, which I know has been in big discussion here. Um, and the reallocation of funds, which I think is a huge piece. I think we can make the budget work tremendously for us if we can just sit down and have that conversation and initiate that dialogue. Uh, social media and the new website, as I mentioned, I've uh, been trying to, you know, update, give updates on Twitter and have the uh, Twitter live feed on the website. So if students or parents or community members want to keep track of teams and they can't make it to the game, hopefully those updates can, you know, create an experience as if they are at the game, even if they can't attend. Um, and there's always opportunity for more participation. As I mentioned, you know, we're at about a 55% participation rate. I'd like to see that go up more. Who's to say we can't get to 60, 65, 70, 75 percent and try to keep climbing, get as many students involved as possible. And lastly, the threats, you know, opposing schools, obviously Hartford has some new facilities, so, you know, we're competing with them. They're a rival school right up the road, so we want to make sure we're staying in that arms race with them for some students. And Windsor, of course, our big rival. We want to make sure we're outshining them anytime possible. <laughs> um, you know, the declining population in the state of Vermont, you know, how do we deal with that? You know, that's not something that's in anybody's control here, but hopefully if we can build 
you know, the facilities and, and build a school that our community and students can be proud of will still end up increasing that overall population in our school, no matter what the case is. Uh, budget constraints, you know, that's a big conversation, you know, that we, we should have. But I th again, I think that, you know, we can reallocate those funds and make that work for us. And lastly, you know, the loss of towns in our district, you know, that may hurt us a little bit, but again, how do we prepare for that? And overall, that's building the premier school in, in, in the state of Vermont, in our region. Q, what is our 55% participation rate? How does that compare to, to towns around us or to other Vermont high schools similarly sized? Um, I don't have the answer for that right now, but I'm happy to do a study with for that and uh yeah, I'm just interested I don't know I'm 55 percent sounds good but I yeah know that, you know, you know and, and some schools have a, l a little bit higher to be honest I do yeah. know that you know it, it just depends on the school it, it depends on what sports are offered as well too you know obviously we offer a lot so there is more opportunity you know other schools don't offer as much as we do um, do we also have a review and evaluation process for our coaches? Yes, so I have implemented a, just this year, a preseason, midseason, and postseason evaluation um, that I hand out to my coaches and also my students do an end of season evaluation on coaching performance as well too. And have you ever considered including parents in that survey at the end of the season? That is certainly some, a question that has come up before, and that is certainly something I am willing to entertain. Okay. Um, my other question for you is when you start talking about budget constraints and reallocating monies and so on and so forth, um, you know, half of it, Five hundred thousand dollars. Does that seem like an appropriate number for you? That just needs to be reevaluated, or do you feel like we're not spending enough money on our athletics? Well, so I'll give you a prime example. You know, our coaches' salaries line. Last year, the adopted budget was one hundred eighty thousand dollars. We spent one hundred fifty-six thousand. Mm -hmm. So that's over twenty grand. That's kind of just sitting there. That. I can't really touch because it's not in the appropriate line. So things like that, when I talk about reallocating funds, okay. you know, maybe we drop that number to 165, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, depending on, you know, where everybody is on the coaching scale for the new coaches that I, I've hired and will be hiring. Um, maybe we drop that number to 165. <coughs> now, you know, that's 15 to $20,000. We can drive right, right back into that boat and uh, into our boat. Um, and also, my last question, I'm sorry, is um, booster clubs or athletic clubs, um, <coughs> I know that we have many of them and they act independently depending on the sport. Right. I also know that there are other schools that have one booster club that acts together yeah. and they also give scholarships to students as they go off to college and so on and so forth. Right. Have we ever considered looking at that process? I think it's something we can look at, but I think, mm -hmm. you know, with, again, with the number of programs we have, we're all kind of trying to fight for the, you know, those extra funds mm -hmm. um, to help No, I'm just curious. Lou, maybe you can speak to this. Do these programs act then independently of, of themselves or are they, are they acting within the school? I can speak for lacrosse. We act yeah. independently because we work with both the youth programs and the recreation and the high school middle school programs. Okay. So kind of overlay all of them and ascertain what needs are and what we can help meet. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and right, and that, that's a prime example, you know, where lacrosse has these thriving numbers because that booster club is in the community and looking at, you know, all grade levels, all the way down to three, four, uh -huh. you know, at the rec department, whereas some of our other booster clubs, they just focus solely on our teams that we offer here. Okay. Bob. Thank you. Um, I, too, would be interested in uh, the participation <coughs> rate comparison. We oftentimes compare ourselves to Stowe. Yeah. There are a couple of school districts out there that need to know what their participation rates are as compared to ours. The other would be the cost of, you know, uh, cost per athlete. 
in terms of the money we're spending and what other schools are spending, right. that would give me some frame of reference as to how we're doing in terms of budget and investment. And I'll agree with you, I think, um, long term, we have an issue of facilities right. related to athletics that we need to, need to get on. Right. Any other, Jim? Um, I'd like to see in the budget with these booster clubs what we're actually, you know, we say we budget, but what is the total budget? Okay. Because if, if, if an athletic booster club is raising, you know, if we're going to allocate money to different places and one place is getting a booster club of whatever, $10,000, $20,000, it would be nice to know what the total budget is for each sport. Do you follow what I'm saying there? Yes. I, I would tell you, having done that, it's kind of driven by projects. It's not like there's money being allocated every year. So, um, but I, I do have a. Um, first, this is really good. Too. It's a great report. Yeah, thank you. I mean, this is like far beyond anything I've ever seen from the athletic department. So, you know, kudos yeah. to you. This is really, really good stuff. Things like, um, you know, the budget line MGF and like the ability to flexibly move some funding like mid year. Do we have a mechanism to help the athletic department do that? So if we know salaries are going to come in lower, but the field hockey teams need uniforms, do we have a way to do that? Are we? Yes, we, a we actually can be supportive in that. I think some of that is, is people getting familiar with the budgets and we're, we've done some realignment, but that is something that we, we do have the capacity to do mid-year. Um, uh, so, uh, Richard, I'm just yeah, checking to be sure that you're okay with that. Item. <laughs> the only other challenge we do have is the salaries for coaches are driven by the negotiated agreement. <coughs> it's included in there as an appendix, so I'm, I believe you're familiar with that. We have to abide by what the negotiated agreement is as it relates to uh, any of the additional additional things people are doing but no the ability to move between light arm is as simple as a request we're going to underspend this and can we allocate it to another area for this year and yeah th there's not an issue with doing that and can that happen within the entire budget or does it happen within the athletic department I mean the fact is when the voters approve a budget they approve a bottom line right so allocation within the budget there's certain flexibility to do that Okay. What you want to try and do is, is keep that relatively controlled so we have an idea of where budgets are actually moving. Yeah. But um, so certainly within a department and if necessary it can be done separate from that. Okay. So another question like things like yeah. uh, mission and philosophy is that something you present to the board and like we vote on or like where does that come from? Is that just? That comes from the administration and from the athletic director. We do not have to approve that. That's within their rights of their job description. Is that correct, Mary Beth? Yeah, <laughs> and, and <laughs> you, want to, you want to talk about where the mission statement came from? Right, so so essentially um, during my, my, grad, my grad school coursework, um, one of our projects was a strategic plan. So kind of similar to, you know, the work that I'm doing right now. Um, where we had to write a mission statement and a philosophy statement. So essentially, you know, I took a look at that. I took a look at what we had for our school and our school district and tried to align it, you know, with our school district and the mission and values and philosophies and goals that, you know, we're trying to achieve here in the district. I will make one last comment. As yes. As board members, um, we should look at the track and field numbers and realize we don't have a track. That's pretty it's amazing. It's been a conversation yeah. for a very long time. Yeah, so I know, but I'm hoping that as we move forward in other conversations, yes. we stay aware of that. And, they, and, that, and that team achieves great Huge. success even yeah. without the track. And they mostly practice on grass. So yeah. that's a testament, again, to the great students that we have. Well, they, yeah. have, they have to go to Windsor to practice. Right, which again, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You don't want to happen in last episode ever. <laughs> See, what would happen if if we rebuild school someday, if we get to that point, if we had an uh, a, um, well, artificial well, turf field, how would that change scheduling, usage, that sort of thing? What would that mean? I think that would be a tremendous opportunity. I think it would solve mm -hmm. one, it would solve probably 90% of the scheduling issues that I have just because sometimes our fields are just aren't playable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it would give us the ability to go later in the day. So. You know, you have more flexibility in terms of the time of day a coach can, you know, assign practices. Okay. Any other questions? I have one question. Yes. 
So these green sheets. Um, so far this year, my son has not had to do one. <laughs> is there, is there <laughs> been a change? We're starting this week. Okay. We want to tell you, all, they're all excited that this yeah. has gone away. <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you that it has not gone away. No, we, we felt it appropriate to start during the first full week of school. So obviously, you know, the first week, you know, was a half week, and then we had Labor Day. So we felt it appropriate to start, you know, during the first full week of classes. So my, my other thought on this is that it seems like it's a lot of wasted paper. <coughs> is there any plan on having this done electronically? Yes. So the initial discussion behind that was we wanted to make sure that, one, we were teaching the students valuable skills, sure. accountability, responsibility, you know, building those connections with teachers, you know, so making sure, you know, you have to talk to your teacher yeah. <laughs> to get those signatures Absolutely. to, to get cleared to play. So now that we've established the process, there is a plan in place to go digitally after the first few weeks of school. And I don't disagree with them going to meeting with their yeah. teachers. Like I know, I know some of the kids have complained that they claim that they've actually passed their green sheet in right. and it somehow got lost and then they can't participate. Right. Even if it is, uh, you know, said that they could participate. Right. You know, it's not like they're in poor standing. Right. Um, and the second thing that I've heard is um, some of the kids find it hard to fill out the sheets. Uh, some kids like miss lunch because there's such a strict timeline, right. you know, because of the block schedules. Uh, I don't know if there's a way to. Make that easy. Maybe expand the time where they. I mean, I know you still have to get them in and process them. Right. But it seems for some kids it's a challenge. Yeah. And typically, you know, we say by noon on Friday, we typically give them to the end of the school day. But we just want to make sure that kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing at the end of the day. So giving them that hard deadline on paper, you know, gives us the opportunity to get as many green sheets in as possible by the end of the day and get those entered and then communicating to coaches. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank this you. Thank you. That's amazing. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great job. Okay. So October 14th calendar issue. <laughs> Um, I will just briefly give you history and then Mary Beth will bring you up to date. Um, traditionally we have approved calendars that are aligned with um, the Hartford Tech Center and they always send a calendar for us to approve. Very rarely do we make adjustments to that calendar um, because we want our tech students to be able to attend as many classes as they can at the Tech Center without us making it difficult. Um, we had an oversight um, for some reason and I, I think it started at the tech school and came to us but traditionally over the last gosh 10 years or so we have had the 14th off um, and it is a long week. Monday, Monday of Columbus Day. Monday of Columbus Day. Excuse me, not the, yeah, I'm looking at the 14th right now. So we have had the Monday of Columbus Day weekend off. Um, we have always voted on that. Um, when the calendars came out um, at the end of August, it was brought to our attention that the actual day that we have off is the 7th and not the 14th. Um, Mary Beth, now we'll take it from there. <laughs> so yeah, this has been a, a, a challenging situation. Um, and uh, initially, Hartford had um, set the date as the seventh, and their the calendar on their website was set as the, at the seventh. Um, so that's the one that we used. And then later, they actually changed it to the fourteenth. Um, in the interim. <laughs> did not tell us. <laughs> in the interim, um, we had planned a, a great deal of or some really significant professional development for October 7th um, that we cannot reschedule. Um, 
And so we're, we're looking at a situation where we, and this calendar was actually published last spring. Um, in fairness, many families don't glance at it you know, until like, the start of the school year. So for many families, they may have just initially seen that we have the seventh off and not the 14th. Um, we've looked at a, a number of different options around here, uh, around how we can resolve this particular issue. I'm going to offer what I think is reasonable at this point. Um, the, the board does vote the calendar, so if my solution doesn't um, appeal to you or work with thinking work works for the community, we can um, look at some other options. But as I said, this has been published since last spring, and while there are some families that may just be looking at it, there are other families that may have made plans for child care and that kind of thing based on this. So I'm hesitant to either add or take away a, a day because of that, because for some family, they may have already booked child care or anticipating the students being in school um, and that they don't need child care. At the same time, a lot of families have had the history of the, taking their families away for Columbus Day, and that's going to interfere with their their family vacations or trips like that. So, my recommendation is that we may maintain the calendar as it is, but to communicate to our teaching staff that on the 14th, which is Columbus Day, that no homework is due or no tests are given, so that no student is missing anything critical to their instruction. Um, the Columbus Day is not. Not a, a holiday in Vermont. Um, it's one of the few states that actually doesn't have it as a as a holiday. Um, in the past, our teachers have been working on that day, but that would enable us to maintain the professional development that we have built out. The presenter that we have it does not have flexibility in the schedule. He is a, a nationally known presenter um, related to the trauma informed work that. Um, Sherry had, had suggested so it would be and that's going to build on some other learning experiences so so not so not having that day available to teachers would be really problematic um, so that is my recommendation that we maintain it but that I that I communicate with our staff and let them know that the 14th is Columbus Day there may be families that are that are going to be absent due to vacation and to make sure that in the classroom there is nothing that would be um, compelling on that day so that they miss the class and there is going to be some. Hey, no, there'll actually be yeah, absolutely no, there'll be, be learning happening, and then, you know, trying to have that balance. But you know, not a major yeah, test due, not um, a major assignment due. Oh, it's I make a motion to support Mary Beth's solution. Do I have a second? Second. Thoughts. Thoughts. And Patty. Mm -hmm. I, I would just say that if we're going to say there's no homework on a Monday, uh, Garen, this is a question back to you that goes like two or three years ago. We went to this program that Monday is a um, check-in day. Ch it's like every every class is on Monday, and there was not supposed to be any homework due on Mondays. No, it's a good one. I was thinking that <laughs> I think that saying that, that to uh, use Monday in that way isn't out of line with how Mondays are practiced anyway. We don't typically well, typically, but I mean, it was, it was supposed to be that there is not, not typically. Yeah. There's not supposed to be any homework on Mondays, well, at least in the middle school and high school. Yeah, and this is a K-12 piece because right. at the elementary level as well, students will may have things to do at that time. And, and then just, you know, the calendar is as, and it shows that the day is not off, correct, on the 14th? Because we're talking about it. Right, because we're talking about it now. I mean, so if families have this from months ago, who, why, would, why would I schedule a vacation if I had the calendar in front of me months ago? But if we're going to go with this suggestion, okay, that we're going to say that <coughs> if you have a vacation day, you don't have you know if you plan the vacation you're not going to be here is that day then going to be counted against you for your allowed days off that's 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 all my bigger question is is that you know because we do have a rule in school if you're out so many days you're 
Yeah, if there was a situation with the family where that was a, a consideration and the, the family is indicating it was a family vacation, then we would, we would honor that and it would not come. Yeah, and, and then I just thought, you really want to get involved in that? I mean, why don't we just, if we're leaning to that families are taking off on the 14th and have always been off on the 14th, then just give the 14th off. Because then you're just, you're just going to start getting but into. Then you're have two Mondays, Mondays in a row off. off. Yeah. No. And the other thing is that you. Know well, then don't do it. But because what you're basically saying is, is that if you have if you have a trip planned, then or you were planning on having a day off, we're okay with it. So okay. Tim, I guess my only question is, is on how does that affect the Hartford students? So on the seventh, Hartford is in in serve in school. So are our students going to be coming in to go to school on that day? Or still they'll have an absentee for Hartford? So they can do the half day in Hartford on the 7th, and then they'll do the morning here on the 14th, but not go to Hartford in the afternoon. Will, they have, will transportation still be offered to them on the 7th or the 14th? Or on, the, on the 7th, no, because we wouldn't be running buses. So um, they would, they could go, but they don't have to find Right, and I, I did have an opportunity to speak to the principal there, and he said that that does happen from time to time, and they accommodate that if a, if a student couldn't make it. So if they don't make it on the 7th, Hartford's not going to... That the, like there are situations like this that come up and they, they will they'll understand and they won't count it against right. them if they and he's don't aware the of the situation we're now in and that it's their fault so they can't the communication is you know can be challenging or the communication we'll be on top of it next year yeah that this will definitely be something we'll take so everybody on this board is here next year and approves that calendar 14th, October 14th. Monday, Monday. Monday. Yeah, we'll have a Tuesday off. The day of the week is Thanksgiving on. <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> Which Thursday right, of the so month? Those, all those in favor of the motion on the table to support Mary Beth's thought of having the 7th, the Monday the 7th off and not Columbus Day Monday. Keeping the schedule as Keeping it. Keeping the schedule yeah. as it was as approved. It. Say aye, please. Aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it. The motion is passed. All righty. Moving on. <coughs> Karen. There we go. So over the summertime, um, Karen and a group of people worked together on solidifying the Grading proficiency policy. Grading, grading the grading policy. policy. Cross out proficiency. We work on a grading policy. Working on a grading policy. And um, <laughs> yeah, so Darren is going to update us on sure. what that grading policy is. Good evening. As we move forward. <laughs> um, so, as you know, last year through the year was about developing this, this grading policy. We've gone through a few iterations in front of this board uh, to look through it. And this summer was about how do we implement the policy with a real focus on how we communicate the policy, how we make sure that parents, community members, students can access this and really understand it's there. So, work with the policy committee several days this summer. Thank you, Pam and Jim, um, and Lou from afar sometimes. Uh, working on making sure that the language in the policy can really be implemented well with the, the systems we have in place in the school. Um, but some things that came through the work this summer um, made a, a primarily a one page document called What Makes a Grade at Woodstock Union High School and Middle School, which explains the main components that go into a grade, um, but also with a clear grade sheet. One of the pieces of the policy emphasizes is making sure that these scores that, that students earn are aligned with understandable letter grades and values that, that people see readily um, on college transcripts or excuse me high school transcripts for colleges these sorts of things so that is in the board packet it was emailed to all students and parents before school started I had an information session right before this meeting this evening that parents attended where I went through some of those pieces and further in those communication pieces we have put all course syllabi on the website uh, piece there one two that came out of the data from last year was a real want to be able to access the standards to understand what's expected in, in courses so people can see 
how the feed document course matches the course expectations. So those are up and posted. Um, the student family handbook has been updated to include um, a lot of school-wide expectations. Before, we had a lot that was based in classroom expectations, and by this I mean things like um, what is the late work policy, what are expectations around turnaround time. These are things that, if you remember, are really well articulated in the policy and putting those into practices in, in those places. Students have seen that. Uh, we will have that out to parents shortly. We're just working on our, our interface. We're getting that online. <coughs> On that handbook, I do have for the board members those updates. You can see from the, the student handbook how the policy is here and what some of those procedures look like. So the board would like a copy of that. Um, other on communication pieces, um, all of the syllabi have the same format. So we really worked on making sure that the, the ways that things are written on there, the, what the grade um, inputs look like and the outcomes look like are in the same format. So an update on where those come through. Um, I think we're in a good place of really putting that policy into practice. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Yes. My question, Karen, is uh, I don't know this for certain. It's just what I've been told through the grapevine from my my son. Uh, he's in eighth grade. He says that he cannot carry his backpack around this year. There's some new. Policy. No. He's allowed to carry his backpack. Your kids are getting out of luck today. Is that a great? I will check on that one. I was nodding my head affirmatively. No, Matt, I've heard that too. Eighth grade is not allowed to. Right. So why is it, and why is we picking on the eighth grade this year? <laughs> <laughs> Your son is in it. For fodder for the right? So, can I just, yeah, a quick question. Yeah. Like, this whole project, proficiency-based grading, grading policies, I don't want to get Jim mad by saying proficiency. Yeah. I get in trouble. But, um, but you know, one of our goals in doing all this was to make sure that like the grading from class to class to class had consistency, right? And that there was an understandability for students, for teachers as well, and, and for parents and everybody involved. And then also that it meant something to the outside world. Do you feel like we've come closer to that through this process? And how far do we have to go? Yeah, great point. I feel we've come much closer to that this is the, as far as clearly saying this is the way that grades are form formatted in, across classes is, is really a place we come to. A, now we can say all courses do this this year. And as far as that outside piece, this is one of the feedback we received a lot, was making sure that that transcript and what's put out to other agencies is really clear and understandable. We've gone with a straightforward letter grade system with a four-point GPA behind it, which is really the standard, I would say. So I hope that's important to parents. And then the other thing I would ask is, you know, we do make some uh, procedural changes to, um, like, some of the rules around acceptance sort of, um, like, work and that sort of thing. How's that been received by the teachers? Um, how's that received by the teachers? I would say um, it's a, um, what's a good way to say it in general? I would say in general on this one, what feels good in, in the teachers and in the school is when we have a collective action that's all behind us. So I would say that that's a good one. The, the reason I, I paused on it is there's also people updating their practices. Like, I'm used to doing this at home. But as far as that commitment to here are school-wide expectations, we're all going to hang in these, that's a good spot. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Pam? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this that you just handed us is going into the handbook when it's done? Yeah, so that's an excerpt from the handbook. The students have seen it. Um, so that's just the excerpt that's been to the So I have two questions. Yeah. One is, I saw online that the handbook, it says coming soon. Right. So when is that coming soon? It will come by Friday of this week. Right. Or Monday, um, right? Yeah, Friday this week. Yeah. And then the other question I have is that uh, this is grading policy and procedures, but it's really policy. So is the procedures... So the policy statements in the beginning, and mm -hmm. then from the policy, there are some key pieces that you look at where procedures are there. So the policy, for example, says... Oh, like you gave them the Exactly. Money. So the policy says there is turnaround time, and this goes in. So this piece for the student handbook has some of the policy language guidelines. That was important for students to see okay. that. But then the procedures... This is what we were asking for, yes. the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just formatted in a way that I thought they would be clear. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then, Darren, the one other thing that I don't see in here is, is that we had said that, let's say, in um, the standards, they would be told in the beginning that they're being tested, say, three times on, let's say, in math, it's three times on a certain standard. 
and then in science might be five test scores, five actual summatives. Remember we were going through that? Different classes have right. different amount of summatives. So that, that's into the course syllabus. You want to look at kind of the, the way, so if you look at the specific about where it breaks down. So, in, so this is the, you know, the standards across all things, and that's in the end of the Right, but, but when, I see the, when, I, when I see my daughter's um, syllabus that came out, okay. Okay, I'm not seeing that. I'm, I'm not seeing that yet and that was the one thing because what we did say through these meetings was that knowing that the last score is 65 percent of your score okay this is this is a continuation from day one yes you have a score you could have a 3.3 but that's only worth X amount and as you move down towards the end of the year you know, that last one is going to be 65% of your score, and it would be nice that the children or students would know that in this class they're actually having three summatives or they're having four summatives on that standard. So, so there's a variable in, in where that impact comes in. So remember the, the way the grades are computed is there are individual standards, as Jim's saying, in the courses they go from four to, to six in a course. And those standards, uh, have that weighting average going on. So the more recent work does count more for the score, more for most recent work. Um, but those individual standards are all weighted equally in the overall grade calculation, right? So we have that piece. So there's a lot of variation there across classes, a variation between how many standards are in a course based on the science course or math course, so that's a variation. Um, and so with that level of variations, at what point can teachers be that determined? So with the guide point that Jim said, one thing that, that is an expectation for teachers is that in each of those standards, there are at least three standards we be there. Um, but as far as to really kind of come down on, here's the, the clear prescriptor on each one, that was a constraint that's difficult to come to. So where the emphasis is here for students, or for teachers to students, is to be much more communicative about those things. So for example, if you look at the turnaround time too, making sure that if it, there's the standard turnaround time of six school days on a summative assessment, but if there's a lengthier assignment, like a long reading, the teachers can say it. So back to Jim's point, saying that we haven't had that exact standard for expectation for all classes, but that's the sort of questions that students can ask going back to our loose head, where are we the standardization of practice? So if we have this, it matters how many assessments we can ask it. So long we're saying, you know, we don't have that degree of, of certainty in all classes, but we do have the open place for communication about it. So, so, so back to let's just take one class, <coughs> say English 1. Right. Okay, and there's two teachers teaching English 1. I mean, the main thing. Will they, do they have set that there will be the same amount in each teacher's testing? The across courses teacher to teacher has a high degree of, of kind of standard practice. So we don't have like real difference in, in those ways. So that's true. Okay, so yeah. so one class, if, if, if the same English one, there's this class here, teacher A is giving reading, and there's three summatives on reading. Right. In the other class, there's three summatives. It's not sure. going to be where it's two or four or five. <coughs> right. And that you say so that the, the, a student right. taking different, the same class, but with a different you teacher. You want to make sure they're aligned. I want to make sure they're aligned. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. So the summative might be, the, as you said, it may not be exactly the same, but it's in the same content and the volume is the same. And I'm talking about the volume. Okay. That's all I'm talking about. Each teacher is going to have a different right. test or right. a way of testing. Yeah. Any other questions? Great. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank Thanks for all of you for all of your work this time. Okay. So we're going to go into our Prosper Valley Engineering Report and the next steps that are being recommended. I want to make it very clear to everybody in this room, the board is not taking a vote tonight one way or the other. We are also listening to the report as well so that we can ask questions um, as, as board members and also to think about how this builds into other considerations with our improvement plan conversations that's centering around our existing campuses as well as a possible new build in our future. So I just want everybody to be very clear about that. After the report, we will welcome questions from the community members, as I had said earlier today, and then we will take questions from the board members afterwards, okay? Excellent. 
Joe, you're on. Okay, so good evening. Um, I'm here to give you an update on Prosper Valley School. Um, it's time to take some next incremental steps or at least discuss what's going to happen next at the uh, school. So why don't we just start with a brief background. So everybody knows the story. We, uh, last year about this time, uh, we had some more growth in the school. We cleaned it up and uh, then we took some air samples and we still found high levels of mold spores in the school. So we installed some relative humidity meters throughout the school to give us an idea of the amount of humidity that was in the school and what was coming up through the slab. Uh, the board approved 25,000 for us to contract with some engineers and evaluating the problems at Prosper Valley School. So we used three different contractors. We did uh, Turner Building Science and they focused on uh, trying to identify the water source beneath the slab and determine how a uh, slab, slab depressurization system might be used to lower the amount of vapor coming up through the slab into the building. Sandboard and engineering came in and they did uh, subsurface exploration of materials found underneath the school. So what they did is they dug up underneath the slab, they looked at the materials that were placed under there, the engineer fill, and um, they gave us a report on that. Uh, engineering Services of Vermont has been hired to uh, design an HVAC system when we get to that point to uh, suck the water basically out of the school with a dehumidifier. So in summary, basically there's a significant amount of water vapor pressure underneath the foundation slab at that school, forcing its way into the building. And that leads to higher levels of moisture, which could bring, bound, <coughs> bring back some more issues we have with the mold. So we got the engineering studies back and they all basically agreed that what we should do is install a sub-slab depressurization in the school to limit the amount of water vapor underneath the slab coming into the school. The board uh, gave us $7,500 to do that, we did. Um, we also installed three monitoring wells in the school. We dug down and placed them at four feet into the slab and uh, we've been monitoring those and we found no standing water in those wells at all. So what's coming up into the school is not actually water. There's no water moving up through the slab, but rather water vapor. They've also recommended that we install a dehumidification system in the building. Um, we could do it one of two ways. We can do standing alone units, or we can integrate it into the existing air handling system that we have. They also suggest that we repair the footing drains. Uh, currently, all the footing drains uh, are clogged. The clean outs for the drains uh, over the years have worked their way out and the drains have filled in with uh, debris so they're clogged and it's not actually moving water that's coming off the roof uh, away from the building. It's just basically sitting around the building. They also suggested that uh, we replace all the flooring in the school with a permeable type flooring. In other words, uh, a carpet that will breathe, a tile that will breathe and actually let moisture come up into the school and suck it out through the uh, humidification unit. <coughs> this graph shows, or this picture shows, basically um, uh, all of the relative humidity meters that we placed in the school. There's about 50 of them in there. The reds and the oranges are the highest readings. That's where the most moisture is coming up through the slab. So if you notice, on the outside, the perimeter of the buildings, the building, it's yellow and blue. Those are the lowest readings. So that indicates to us that water isn't actually coming in through the foundation sides, through the slab, but at rather coming up through the middle of the slab. And its heaviest condensation or concentration is directly through the middle of the school, kind of running east to west out of the length of the school. This shows uh, the sub-slab depressurization system that we installed in the school. We put three drops in the school, and what that does is um, we drilled through the slab, <coughs> we placed a pipe through the slab, excavated below that, and then installed fans. And what it does is relieve some of that pressure that's underneath the slab, and we suck it out and send it through the roof vent. What I found <coughs> is we've been monitoring those arbitrators for about the past 10 months. In the last six months since we installed that depressurization system, uh, we didn't see much of a change in those relative humidity sensors. They're all still about the same, at around the 90th percentile. Um, 
the air temperature changes with the weather because we're constantly moving air through that building, whether it be through open windows or the air handling system, it changes. If it's humid outside, it's humid in the building. So industry standards for relative humidity readings by flooring manufacturers suggest that the reading sh should at least be in the 80th percentile for the floor to properly adhere. That's the problem that TPS had in the beginning when they first built that school. The flooring in the gym wasn't adhering at all. It kept delaminating and coming up. And they actually did some exploration. They cut a big hole in the floor. They looked for a source of water. They couldn't find anything. So um, a couple of the pricing I uh, looked at, or a couple of the options that I looked at, one was sealing the floor within a, a sealant. And, um, and we also found a permeable flooring that is guaranteed to stick up to 99% relative humidity, which is basically no standing water. If the floor is damp, it should stick. It's guaranteed. The guarantee is for materials and labor only, though. They wouldn't guarantee if we had any issues with the walls or furniture in the building. So <clears throat> we're down to a few recommendations now. Um, the first option for us to do is basically what the engineer suggested, uh, the full package, which would be repair the exterior foundation drains. Um, they're clogged. Uh, I don't think that they're clogged completely through around the whole building. I think it's just certain areas. We might be able to flush those out. But if we do wind up um, redoing the drains completely, we should waterproof the foundation because it will be exposed. It's a good opportunity to do that. They also suggested that the relative humidity monitors, we did that already. They also suggested that we seal the concrete slab with an epoxy sealant. Um, we can install the flooring over that. Um, it would be $170,000 to replace all the flooring in the school except for the few tile areas that are recently new. They would stay. They seem to be able to breathe. The grout lines in the tile are actually letting moisture escape out into the building. Um, if we decided not to seal the floor, because it's only a suggestion, uh, it would be about $40,000 less. Removal of all the floor coverings, the counters, all the way back to the interior walls. Most of the cabinetry in that school over the past 20 plus years, um, folks who work there can see this as well, that they start to delaminate. They're all swelling. The formica is peeling off. They all need to be replaced. They've been <coughs> there for about 20 years now. Uh, the, <coughs> the wall covering throughout the school is homosote wall covering, which is basically compressed cellulose, um, newspaper print, basically. And it's compressed, and it has a uh, burlap covering on that. We tested that. We didn't find huge amounts of moisture in that, and we didn't find any mold growth on it. But rather safe than sorry, it would be better to get rid of that homosote and replace it with drywall. To do that, paint the interior portion of the school, that's all the classrooms and everything except for areas where the ceiling perhaps where it's not too bad would be about 45,000. Um, we need to complete the HVAC engineering study and what he's been doing is monitoring those relative humidity monitors. Um, I update those uh, a couple times a week. Our engineer is looking at that and he's crunching the numbers and he will be able to size the system to take care of the amount of moisture coming up from the slab into the building. To go ahead and build out the classrooms, that's replacing all the countertops, um, whatever else might be needed, cabinetry in that school for about 85,000. Complete a final cleaning of the building. Now this is what is actually known as remediation. That's where they'll come in with HEPAVACs and they'll basically clean from the ceiling on down. They'll also mist the school with uh, an organic material that's made out of, I think, um, it's crushed up uh, grapefruit seeds, believe it or not, and it kills mold spores. So we would miss the school as well as the air handling system in there to make sure that all mold spores are in that building are dead. And then for the next month or perhaps for the next following few years, we would do some air quality testing in that school just to ensure that the rates are going to climb up again. These are recommendations that we came up with above and beyond the uh, engineers. Um, if for some reason we don't have to dig up all of the footing drains, we should still remove the landscape around the building because currently the beds are built up so high, all the water is basically pitched to the building. Uh, it needs to be removed in the building. Uh, the landscape needs to be graded away from the building. 
I would also like to install a uh, second daylight to the drain system itself. Currently, there's only one, and if that were to get clogged, um, we'd have an issue with it back up again. It'd be great to have redundancy and stick a second drain in there. Uh, we would also like to put in a few yard boxes at the roof valleys because what happens is we have a few thousand yards of uh, a few thousand square feet of roof and all that water basically comes down into one area of the building it'd be great to catch it in one basin and move it directly away from the building rather than have it percolate down through the soil against the slab and then move it away other couple options we have are basically just to go in, remove the flooring, the cabinetry, the home salon walls, install the dehumidification unit on the building, and basically just put the building to sleep for a while and monitor it and watch what happens. Um, to get that dehumidification unit up and running and all the flooring off, it would give us a true indication of how well that's gonna work, because this is basically the worst case scenario. All that moisture is coming up into the building. Can we get it down to uh, a good enough humidity level where we won't have mold growth, which will be about 55%. The other option we have is uh, really basically maintain it as it is and just do what we're doing now, which is uh, going in a few times during the week, opening windows, checking out things, getting air movement, uh, moving things around, and again, monitoring the uh, school itself and making sure that it's up and running. So in summary, we've had this moisture issue since the building was built. Mold growth in August of last year resulted in students going over to West. Uh, engineers haven't been able to, neither has the folks who built the school 20 years ago, to figure out where the moisture is coming from and how it's getting into the building. The vapor barrier is still there. We found that when we uh, dug through for our monitoring wells. We pulled out plastic. That isn't to say that the uh, vapor barrier hasn't been compromised or it's perforated and let a moisture up, but there is in fact a vapor barrier there. Uh, remediation cost, full bore, again, that's doing everything would be about half a million dollars. Uh, if that's the route we're going to go, um, you'd be looking at six, eight months, possibly a little bit longer, depending on how contractors in the world, we can get them in there to do their work. So we're at that point now where um, it's time to think about what the next steps might be. Um, Richard might be able to speak to this a little bit better as far as money and <coughs> how we might be able to make this a reality. Yeah, depending on where the conversation goes, um, when we get into this $550,000, there really are two options. We can do that through a bonding, <coughs> excuse me, or we can do it straight through the budget. If you do it through a bonding, let's say that that bond is a 10-year bond, you're then spreading that $500,000 cost over 10 years. If we did it all within one budget, then the budget would increase by that $550,000 but it would all be expense in that one year. So there'd be a pop in the tax rate or a pop in the budget for one year, then back down again. And again, that's related to if the determination is to go forward or remediation now, how is it funded, bonding <coughs> or, do or, or doing it through the budget? Uh, and then on the other, on, on the other ones that, um, that Joe had, had gone through, as far as, you know, in effect, putting the building to sleep for a period of time or letting it continue <coughs> to sit. It's clean, it's, it's safe, it's secure right now. But the $130,000, same thing. Do we want to wait and do that as a part of a bond and spread the cost out, or do we just want to incorporate that into the fiscal 20 budget? <coughs> I'm sorry, the fiscal 21 budget. We're already in the 20, so it would be the next, the next budget. And we can incorporate that in there. So the first question is remediation versus putting it to sleep and allowing the building, what's the name of that committee? The building configuration, roll configuration roll. committee. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Bob. Um, to determine how the building will be used. So it can you put to sleep awaiting that or start down through the process. So first is how to use it and the second one will be how to fund it. Would it maybe be possible to <coughs> spread the 550 across two budget cycles? Um, it's difficult, to, it, it depends on how we're going to use the building. If the building needs to be open on a July 1st in order for it to you know, be open during the school year, the expenses would take place within that school year. Because the project, it can't be broken up into phases necessarily, it needs to be completed. If we're multi-phase, we might be able to do that. Um, how much does a uh, half a million dollar budget item in our budget affect our tax rate 
Is it one cent? Is it two cent? Is it, what, what are we kind of looking at, just idea-wise? That's a tough question. Well, <laughs> it, it, it's something I'm not remembering what I, what I worked up. Let me, let me take a look at that, and I'll, okay. I'll let you know on that one. Yep. And the same thing with a bond. Correct. Yep. I mean, it would, it would affect each town differently. But correct. It, it, yes, after the CLA, you're, you are correct, but it, it still is a no, fixed there, increase it, in it what could the base budget be is. Penalty phases. What, if you if you if you bond it, it's going to be over ten years. If you put it out for a bond, it's over ten years. It's fifty five thousand. Would fifty five thousand dollars put any town into a penalty phase? Um, if you did it all in one year, um, five hundred fifty thousand dollars split out amongst the different towns has a different effect on each town because each town has a different Correct. part of the budget. And so it may put in one town into a penalty phase. I believe we had that once before where Killington was the only town that was put into a penalty phase on something. Yeah, it, I hear you, Jim, but really not quite down that, that direction because we're a, we're a modified we're we're union now. So it, it affects everyone the same way. The effect on this is about five cents if we on a dollar 62 base rate so approximately five cents to put it all within one budget mm -hmm. and split it over 10 years it'd be one tenth of that so just curious just yep. so we have an idea but we could have a full presentation at our, our next meeting on that that could be more detailed mm -hmm. so the bigger question joe is and i think it's come up i mean we want to move forward on this but there's been a question that always comes if we if we go full in on the five hundred fifty thousand, it's really five seventy because you have that twenty thousand dollars additional Correct. on the, <coughs> the three yard yep. drain things. Um, is it going to guarantee that it will be gone? The moisture. I mean, I think that's the question that has been asked at different meetings. So if we go ahead and we say t we say to the the taxpayers, we the board agree that we should move forward with this, and it's going to solve this issue there yeah I would say I'm in the 90th percentile of the, it would work and if there is a question and you guys are concerned about it we could take that second option which would be install the dehumidification unit and, and let it run for a while and let's right. see what happens once that fluorine is removed and all that moisture is coming up that'll give a true indication of whether or not it's gonna work yeah I mean I think that's the biggest question and, and, yeah. and if you're uh, giving I mean, a <coughs> according to the engineers um, it, it shouldn't be an issue. We'd be able to get a dehumidifier on there to be able to suck it out. My biggest concern would be, um, you know, dehumidifiers do generate a little bit of heat. And we need to offset that, especially towards the end of the school year, perhaps, or in May. You know what I'm talking about when temperatures are a little bit higher, and so is the humidity. Um, so, but there's ways around that. I'm talking about the full plan, the full not plan, the 130. Right. You know, yep. The 130 to me sounds like you're just going to be doing another year of testing. Correct. But it would give us an indication of whether or not, you know, things are going to work 100%. We can't say in here, Jim, that it's absolute assurance because we haven't found the water. We just know there's pressure. And but if you size the dehumidification system large enough, we'll do that in order to be able to handle. You know, and Joe's in the 90th percentile. I'm probably a little bit higher than that. I'd be sort of in the 95 in that range or a little higher because we can size that dehumidification system however we want to. What we have to understand with dehumidification systems is they're basically comparable to an air conditioning system. Right. Can you use a lot of electricity? That's so true. there is a cost of doing your. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Cost of that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It'll probably be two or three times the amount that we're spending right now. Um, some of that could be offset with solar. We have some nice property there. Um, we can definitely offset some of that with solar, but uh, it was 18,000 last 18, year in electricity, so that. you can double or triple that. Mm -hmm. I, have, uh, I guess I have three questions. Sure. The drain, clean-out drain, yep. you're talking about digging down, cutting the pipe, putting the T with it. Correct. Those Cleanouts <coughs> work their way off over the years and they popped sure, off sure, sure. and filled it. Yep. So, I mean, but that's five minutes worth of work. Yeah, I don't know how much if it is you, clogged. If you, right, but if you end up having to dig down. If I end up doing that, yeah, we'll just flush them out and that'll drop that price considerably because all we'll be doing is hydrogenning, mm -hmm. all that stuff right out of there. We'll still need to install a second daylight sure. and, and um, uh, catch basins. 
Sure. No, I agree with all that. Yep. Um, my second question is the drywall. Yeah. Is it going to be like green board drywall, like you put in the bathroom for more? I, I don't. I don't think we need to do that, especially with the dehumidifier going. And I tested that homeless soap. We actually stuck probes in it, and uh, it didn't have real high levels of moisture, actually below the threshold for us. But um, it's just it. It, it's not the proper thing to have in there, especially if we have issues no, I, like that. I totally agree. My, my last question or concern is, how sold are you on the epoxy? Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of different schools of thought. Um, the epoxy, again, the folks that I've dealt with, they, uh, they swear by it. They're a huge national company. They do lots of universities and school systems. They've never had a failure in 20 some years, and they're willing to guarantee the material, in other words, the flooring, and their labor, if it does reoccur, and yeah. the floor starts at the I, end. I get right? all that. What do you think? What do I think? Um, it makes sense, and it might help a little bit by being able to drop the dehumidification unit to be a little bit smaller. My concern would be you know, the migration of the moisture. Um, what they do is they put baseboard on and they cut grooves in the back of the baseboard to allow that moisture to come out rather than go into a wall or something like that. Um, but they've had great success with it and um, I can get them to come in and give their spiel if you'd like. But um, no, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more hooked on a dehumidifier than, than anything. Yeah. The other challenge we have with epoxy right now is we did build a kitchen over there four years ago. Yeah, about the timing. And we did put a floor down. Mm -hmm. The floor is actually bubbling. Yeah, the epoxy has it has, has integrity, it. but it's bubbling. Yep. Which just raised the question of: Are we better just let it just let it come through? Well, that's that's good. And uh, but I mean that's a worthy debate that we can that yeah. we can have is when we get the buyer to come. You know? Well, to see, uh, uh, to be honest, like I, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I'm probably like the 85 to 90 percent convinced. I mean, listen, I work. I, 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 I work in construction. I've seen all of these problems. Yeah. I know that valley. I've worked in that <laughs> every building has got water issues. Yeah. That brand new red barn down the oh, yeah. has it too. And I mean, it's it's, it's not going to go away. No. And, and, and again, I, I would lean heavily on the dehumidification unit because if we can get one large enough and just let that moisture come up and suck it out of the building, it, it's still less complicated to breathe. Thank you. Just two questions. So sure. the, the 130, that's the removal of all the flooring cabbage cabinetry, sort of getting everything out of the building yep. and installing an HVAC system. Correct. Um, and that would be done, that's part of the 570. That would drop the 550. Or 550. Okay. And then just to, I just want to confirm, so la like last year, the eighteen thousand dollars in electricity that was like this past year. No, that, that was that was our school was in that that was last year with the school phone. Yeah, I think we did about thirteen thousand. Yeah, about thirteen. Yeah, because we're still running the fans. We're still you know, operating. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. Air units are still running. The, the furnace is still running. And with, and with the HVAC system, I mean, even though I assume it's like super efficient, it still would be between thirty-six and fifty-four thousand dollars a year in, I, in electricity. I'm guessing at that, but the engineer would be able to nail nail that down for us once we've crunched. I mean, you're basically going to be running this thing like you're Yeah, if you run a dehumidifier in your house, all the time. you notice your ability to shoot right up. Yeah, they it, the moment that you shut it off, that moisture is going to start building in the building. Can, can we just take some questions from the audience? Because I promised them that we would take questions before the board. So <laughs> let's just take a few questions. Yeah, can you introduce yourself? And stand up, introduce yourself so Raina has your comments. Hi, I'm Thank Seth Westbrook. I'm a former Pomfret school board member, uh, Pomfret resident, extremely familiar with the building. Um, I manage the tile install in the lobby that's working uh, and is <laughs> porous. Um, I can tell you that ground, baseline, dirt, ground, relative humidity, 100%, generally speaking. So the ground is 100% relative humidity. So the moisture, whether it's clearly not a river under the building, but there's moisture because we're attached to the ground. So the, the vapor barrier is below the sand, correct? Correct. How much sand? 18 to 20 inches. 18 to 20 inches, a band of sand touching concrete. Concrete, is concrete porous or not? Oh yeah. It is porous. It's a sponge. Yeah, it's porous. So where's the water going from the roof? 
right along the side there. Yeah. To the porous concrete? It comes up from underneath and gets into the building. Yeah. To the porous well, sand? We don't know where it comes from. Well, it it, well, well water comes off the roof. Yeah. It sits. It's not graded properly around the building. It's sitting in water next to porous concrete, which is attached to porous sand, which the grain structure of sand is very fine and allows for wicking. And it allows for capillary action of water sucking from the concrete, which is sitting in water, into the building, which has a lower relative humidity and therefore is acting as a continual cycle. straw. And the, the vent pipes that you're putting in are doing the same thing because the source is not controlled. Correct. So if there's a vapor barrier under the sand, I'd say the next step is the next source potentially is the walls. Waterproof the walls, and that's you know pretty good likelihood of the source. Yeah. The other thing is, in terms of mold growth, if you control the relative humidity and the temperature in the building, you can't have mold growth. So the mold won't grow if the humidity and air handling system is working. So I would encourage, you know, some common sense steps in terms of eliminating a very obvious source of water. And then, you know, the, the system will work. It, you can't have mold growth if the conditions don't allow for it. It's a plant, kind of. Correct. Yep. It's so that percentage. It needs um, <coughs> but also my meters on the outside of the building are some of my lowest readings or my highest are right in the center which which goes that you would think if the water's coming down along the sides of the building that my higher readings would be along the outside but still water is getting through that foundation into the building but anyway that's my that's my take on it i think that some work could happen and and get things moving along and i agree um, i'd like to see kids back in that building at some point soon if I could just add to an addendum to what Seth just said, the other thing that we we talked about being involved with all this was was janitorial services in the building. You know, and we you you talked Joe about organic material on the building, the cleanliness of the building. Sure. You know, and if we put this building back together and we have a full time custodian, sure. we're we're going to increase the likelihood that this system works. Again, and I, like and like I think said. that's a huge factor yeah. in, in all of this is um like is how said, well the building is maintained by a full time janitorial yeah. person. Yeah. And, and in order for mold to grow it needs yep. a certain environment. And right. if we take a piece of that away, it won't grow, whether it be humidity or and that was originally the plan we had for the first time a, a janitor coming back in um, had the that year gone forward um, to be there full-time and then he ended up moving on because we weren't in the building so any other questions from the audience yeah She's like nice to you. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Bob Green. I live in Pomfret. Put both my boys through that school. They're blessed. Yeah. Um, two questions. Is the sub slab mitigation system sucking air out of the Yeah, it's into the it's into that sand layer. Isn't that forming a vacuum which if the source of the water is coming from the roof and partially through the concrete slab in, in that it may be sucking more water in? In theory it could. Um, they're placed in the center of the building, um, but it's more there to quote unquote relieve that pressure that's underneath. That was the intent of the engineers, was to relieve that pressure that's underneath. If that turns out to be the case, can the heat from the dehumidification system be pumped back in, creating a positive pressure of hot air, which might move? Yeah, that's the good question. I uh, have to look into that. I've asked the engineers. Uh, Kevin Geiger, I'm Pomfret resident, for, former uh, school moderator. Um, my question, two questions, and they, I think they're yes or no answers. But it seems like there's outside work, mm -hmm. foundation, drains, ceiling, all that type of stuff. Inside work, drywall, cabinets. That strikes me that that could be two separate contracts. There's no need necessarily to have one contractor where the drywallers are digging holes and the ditch diggers are drywall. 
Oh, it, it'd be different contractors for sure. <coughs> yeah. um, the second thing is, given the timing, uh, it's possible you know you do all this work and it's going into the budget for next year, which then gets voted on, and then that money typically frees up July one, and then you know we could start the work, which would maybe mean that that school, even if we did everything, that that school wouldn't be open in the fall of next year because the money wouldn't free up and the contract wouldn't start. And so my question is, is there any reason, legal reason, um, why there can't be a vote earlier? There can be a special district-wide vote, I believe. We could hold it in 40 days from now and vote that money if we wanted to. It's a hassle, I know. It takes stuff. But I, my question is, is there a legal reason why that can't happen versus it's just a hassle? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a good question. I think at, as it relates to a bond, we can vote for a bond any time we would like to. As it relates to adding money to the budget, which ultimately changes a tax rate inside of a year, I don't know how that could be done at the state level. I believe the tax rates are set once a year and therefore so. From that side, I don't believe so. As far as doing a bond, that can be done at any time we uh, decide we want to warn, vote a bond, and then go through the process. Jim? So, I mean, I mean yeah. we'd like to open the school. That's what we said in the beginning. We wanted to move forward and try to find the best way to open up, reopen the school up. Um, our next vote is March, whatever, first Tuesday of the month in March. Okay. I think what we need to be doing here is actually preparing to have a vote I think it's beyond the board members to keep on asking questions and having us give technical information or even the audience give technical information. We, we, we've, we've, we've hired an engineer on, we have an answer. It's 550,000 plus, you know, 570 with your, your thing in there. What we need to do is move forward, say 570, put it out to the voters for a vote. We need to actually find out what that 550, 570 is going to do to each town's tax rate, because that's what we're here for, okay, it's the tax rate. We also need to include what that system is going to increase the cost per pupil over at the Pomfret School also, and what it does to the district, okay? And, um, and go from there, and then let the voters have the vote. We also need to ask Mary Beth what the needs of the district are now as things have shifted over the last couple of years as a merged district. Um, and we should be getting her recommendation <coughs> as well as to what those needs are too. Um, I think that's going to be something we have to talk about as well um, as we move forward with this conversation. Sure, yes, you have a question. My name is Deanna Jones, and I'm a Pomfret and now Woodstock uh, parent and kids from pre-K to high school. Um, so I, I, I'm concerned about putting something like that out to vote without um, even parents and definitely commun community members who are going to vote on it, knowing how the school will be utilized. So who does it, you know, what children would be going back to that school and that kind of thing. I would hope would be part of the presentation before people are asked to vote on it. So that it's not, you know, people in Killington or Reading having to feel like all this money is going to Pomfret and, and maybe Bridgewater as a school. Um, but just to really understand how that school will be utilized. Um, I know having children in West now, it feels very crowded. I mean, even just the daily uh, pick up and drop off there's too many children there. It does not feel safe in that pickup area. I'd love to see children move back out to that wonderful country setting with beautiful grounds and being able to utilize that. Um, it just feels very hectic um, the way it is right now. So, so Paige, to finish up where I was going? No, Jim, we, have, we, we yeah. just have one more fellow over here. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. 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 So, Bill Overbay from Pomfret. I, I think I've heard a couple of interesting things tonight. One being, can we spread the money out? Right, that's, that's a really interesting thing. Another one, how do we best use the facilities that the district has? And I think we're contemplating, I've heard a rumor maybe, we're contemplating a high school build. That was a little facetious, mm -hmm. right? I think that's a hot topic around here. That's gonna cost some money. If we're looking at 
five hundred and seventy thousand dollars ballpark to get the school in working order that could be used for a middle school or something else freeing up space somewhere else in the district what would it cost to build that same square footage to house those same number of students in a new building and at, at what point do we look at this on a dollars and cents thing and say I, I think there are schools in America that have a school districts that have six seven and eight as a middle school can that work here if we have a building that could be used for that purpose and it's going to cost us six hundred thousand dollars to quote build it versus I, I don't know what it costs per square foot to build the high school the new building is about 300 a square foot and that building's about 20,000 so you're looking at a six million dollar building so six hundred thousand dollars versus six million it's ten percent and we and I don't think we've made a decision on building the high school but is it that's not going to happen tomorrow I don't think we'll have a new high school by September of next year it would take some time does that give time for things to percolate or not in the Pomfret school having spent the money to reopen it and use it for what's a newer building than some of the other places that we have to use and I think that as you go through your deliberations, you look at the total cost of ownership and to build something versus use and retrofit. And how much of the budget that you were talking about is regular scheduled preventative maintenance or maintenance capex that's gonna go on, i.e. painting, i.e. you have to replace desks, maybe some cubbies are broken, right? How much of that would happen on a regular basis anyway? And is it fair to kind of build that in? Does that 550 number fluctuate a little bit once we've been able to take those things out or add some other things? <coughs> yeah, that, that number can change depending on how uh, the building is going to be <coughs> utilized. Definitely. Do we have uh, younger kids in there and or older, or do we need the cubbies or not? Yeah. So, Paige? Yeah. Back to you. I think it's a two part where I'm going from on this is that we need to move forward okay on what's put in front of us I mean to build a six million dollar building sir at 2.25 percent interest rate over 30 years is a payment of twenty two thousand nine hundred thirty five dollars a month times that by 12 is two hundred seventy five thousand dollars two hundred twenty two dollars per year for the next 30 years just to give you an idea of compared to a five hundred and fifty thousand dollar over 10 years which is fifty five thousand yep. so that, and that that's right off of that anonymization I'd rather calculate. Spend 55 than 200. Right. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just getting, yeah. just, just giving that to you because you did ask that question. But we need to put this forward to have the numbers put in front of the finance committee as far as what it's going to do. I believe a lady in the back there that you know you did bring up a, a good point. It is to try to find out. I mean, you're saying you would move back to, but. I don't know, there may be some students that will not move back there. I don't know, but we need to know that how many students will be going back to the school. And we also need to have the report from Mary Beth. Correct. And, so and, 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 and that's where I, th I think we have three things in front of us and, and we need to move forward instead of just keep on asking the technical questions of, you know, yes, I put a suction cup, I put a straw in the middle of a building with 16 to 18 inches of sand and I start sucking on it, yeah, I might be pulling the water from further away in. I mean, so we got to get away from that. Let's get all the questions from the audience because that's what we really want to hear because we know we have more work to do in our consideration of how we're going to move forward with this building. One, we need a recommendation from the superintendent of what our needs are within the district. And two, we need a financial report of what the ramifications are on our taxpayers, whether or not we go for a bond or a budget. And we really have to break that down um, to a detailed breakdown so that the voters, if it was a bond or a budget item within our upcoming budget, they can make a really intelligent, educated choice on whether they will vote yes or no. But they also have to have the understanding of what our what our needs are within the district and how we foresee us using that building in the future if we reinvest this money into that particular building. 
it's very, very important. So let's take more questions from the audience. Ma'am? So in your, in your work to assess the educational needs of all the students in the district, mm -hmm. how long is it going to take you to figure that out before you're ready to present that to people? Because I agree with you, that has to be part of the decision-making process. But that's a take-time thing, isn't it? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so we actually have a meeting of the configuration committee confirmed for um, September 19th. So I'll be bringing information about what our current needs are in the district, and then the configuration committee will be listening to that. It is actually the configuration committee that makes the final recommendation. I will bring some thoughts and recommendations to them based on what we see in enrollment, based on what we see about if we put X in, in, into place, what other cost does that generate versus if we put Y into this, this space. So I am anticipating that we will have that information to the board by October. They're going to need it by then to start to make decisions. Well, that's, that's very encouraging because I didn't realize you were that far along in the process. You know, because it does seem like you, you just got to have that picture. Right. Yes, right. You need the whole picture. You yeah. can't just have yeah. parts. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any? Uh, yes. Gentleman with the blue. Hi, uh, Joe Boisbert. I'm the kindergarten teacher, formerly at Prosper Valley, now at Woodstock. Um, just, just slightly, you know, separate issue, but still on the grounds of the school. You know, it was very active last year. Some other teachers and I created a Forest Friday program, and we were bringing kids to the woods area outside, you know, across the bridge from behind the school uh, for the entire school year. Um, it was, it's a magical place and we've put dozens of hours into making that space safe for children, a wonderful learning space. Um, my big question in this is, who's responsible for the bridge? <coughs> what happened to the $10,000 that we were given to fix it? And when will it be fixed? And when can I bring my kids back there? Because parents expect this. It's an amazing program. Um, and right now I'm sort of getting mixed messages on whether, because the bridge is decrepit and it's falling apart. And it's really a shame that such a wonderful resource that's different from Mount Peg, it's different from going to Billings Farms. It's, it's a place that all the kids in Woodstock and Pomfret and Bridgewater could be experiencing in such a wonderful way. And I feel like that issue has kind of fallen by the wayside. It's a fix, I feel like, that can be done in a matter of weeks. And I, I'm, we're talking about one, two, three years down the line. I want to be taking kids out there next month. So I'm just, I'm kind of wondering who can give me an answer on why this is not happening and why is it taking so long? Let me, let me, let me grab that one. Um, <coughs> I, I do remember hearing about a, a donation of Richard, dollars. Right there. I know, so yeah, tell me. Right there. No, I know, but who? I remember it. It was a donation. It was an anonymous donation. Have we received it? Yes. Yes. Ten Ten grand. Grand. Yeah, I'm going to have to find out Ten where it is and why the work hasn't been done. Right there. John Hansen's right there. Ask him. Yeah. We have it. Yeah. Then there's yes. no reason that work can't be done. It needs to be contracted and undertaken. We're so, yeah. The, the latest hold up, the I used a group of engineers from Norwich University who did a, um, uh, they, they made a uh, proposal to us and we're waiting for an <coughs> engineering stamp from an actual engineering firm because students can't, uh, we can't use their design until it is approved by an actual engineering <coughs> firm and that's what we're waiting for. So in short, the funds have come in from this anonymous donation. Yes. And you've already started to spend some of the funds on the engineering part. We, yeah, we we received a ten thousand dollar anonymous donation, and then we have a pledge of up to ten thousand dollars from the uh, Prosper Valley Trust. And yeah. Do we know how much it's going to cost to build the bridge? The estimate is just about twenty thousand dollars. Okay, so you're in the process of doing it. Waiting for the staff. Is anyone, are, are you following this yes. one along? Or you're working with Joe to follow it, or you're really handling this one? I've been handling it. Okay. Well, the answer is there's <coughs> no reason why it shouldn't be able to move forward. And well, as far forward. as a date, we'll have to find out what that date is. It's safe to say it's moving forward. But we don't know a date well, if you want to bring kids there next month. Yeah, well. it's, it's something <coughs> it's moving forward once we get the engineering 
um, stamp, we can you know, start buying the materials to do it. Do we actually need an engineer? Like, <laughs> not necessarily. It depends. I mean, it depends. You know, the design that, that has been proposed, you know, is a covered bridge, and it's been designed to try to withstand the next flood that comes through. Our, that our insurance company will be asking. You're going to put kids on a bridge. You need an engineer staff. Well, listen, coming from a construction background for the last 20 years, I mean, I, I get engineering, but at the end of the day, there's a foundation on one side of the bridge, on the river, and there's a foundation on the other one, and you got a couple steel I beams with some handrails. Yeah. And at the end of the day, dig safe, you know, and all that other stuff too. There was failures. At the end of the day, if somebody's walking across the bridge and something happens, and there's a lawsuit. At the end of the day, I get I get what you're saying also, but you need to have the stamp for it to fall back on someone else other than the school district. So the answer is yes, we, we need an engineering yeah. stamp. That's where I stand. Yeah. So just a little background on that, it's a 60 foot span no. and the abutments on either side are um, kind of field stone homemade yeah, I know. situation. Yeah, terrible, I know. And, um, and then it also has to arch up a little bit, I believe, to have enough clearance for flood water. So, so you agree that it needs an engineer? I mean, I don't know what the code or le legality is of actually needing the stamp, but it's, it's probably reasonable. <laughs> when did the last bridge wash away? September 11th. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I haven't lived here that long. I'm not. I can, so uh, the, the big flood, the big flood we had in April, I went down there and the water was like two feet over the deck of the bridge. So, all I just want to add is that I, you know, participated in a professional development with other uh, educators who were doing outdoor education programs in the Upper Valley. We visited each location. Ours was, I would say, the best out of all of them. We have 28 acres of beautiful forest. I don't, can't think of another school in this district that has something like that. The kids would, deserve to be out there. You know, I think I agree with you, and I, I like the value of you know reinforcing that. We do have other dist you know, other schools in this district district that have outdoor classrooms. So in the meanwhile, working with the, the, the SU of how do we access Reading, Killington, Barner, so that people that are feeling kind of confined to Woodstock, we have other options. We're a unified district now. So furthering that, but also utilizing the other resources we have. Are there any other questions for Joe, Mary Beth, or Richard regarding the Prosper Valley School? Yes. Uh, Seth Westbrook again. My question relates to the four-year protection uh, clause under Act 46 merger agreement. So the residents of Pomfret, as you know, it was a difficult, contentious process. A lot of people voted in agreement to cede ownership of the school to the school district based on the four-year protection. Um, I think there's a concern amongst the residents that this process is taking a long time and that the clock is being run out. So I'm just wondering the status of the Prosper Valley School. Is it closed? Is it open? Is it, what is it? And, and how does that relate to the four-year protection clause? There you go. Yeah, I mean, it's a complex question, of course, because in the four-year protection clause, they didn't have anything like this considered. Um, I, you know, I think that right now the, the board has indicated that they are interested in trying to fix the building. So we are undergoing the steps that need to be taken for that. Um, it, and so, you know, the question would, I think, would, be, would come up is what would happen if the voters voted it down, right? Because we, ha we have a couple processes that we have to honor. One is that the voters have to vote a budget and agree to the tax increase. Um, and so if that occurs, and then there should, there should be a, a challenge in terms of reopening the building in, so, in some capacity. Um, if, it, if the vote is voted down, then that, I would guess at that point we're going to have to get some significant legal counsel on where that stands. To follow up on that, I would like to make a request that any number that goes to the voters be an extremely accurate, uh, thoroughly bid number that reflects actual costs and scope of work <coughs> more I know Joe that you've been doing that but just yeah more I mean, more accurate it, still exactly. these numbers are based on industry standard I haven't gotten any proposals 
because I don't know what direction we're going in. Right. If you folks give me direction, I, I can give you some firm pricing. Right, so <coughs> 570 is still a ballpark number. Because we don't know how, what we're going to do with the school, how it's going to be built out. Right, so my, my concern is that 570 goes to voters. People are like, way too much money, no way. Let's go to option, you know, whatever it was, three, put it in a medically induced coma and forget about <laughs> it for three years. <laughs> No, I think that in order to come up to a final bottom line, as soon as we have direction, we can fine tune those. So what, what you're getting here is the best thinking given that we don't have final direction. If we know how the building is going to be used, how many kids are going to be there, what's going on, and we know what the build out will be, we know what the flooring requirements are, we know how the multi-purpose room will be used. Is it going to be just multi-purpose? Do you want to make it more of a gym? Do you want to make it more recreational? Different floor. So we have to get answers to those. And absolutely, we don't want to borrow any more than we need to. But we also don't want to be on the short side of it. So you're, you're absolutely right, and that's the process. Can I just, uh, just a note that, uh, you know, uh, I have some concern that if we're putting a, a bond issue before the voters, perhaps a year before we're putting a big bond issue before the voters, there'll be a little bond, bond fatigue. So I remain concerned about how we go about uh, go about the financing and as you know, part of it, as co-chair of the committee that's sort of looking at or been charged with looking at um, you know, the future of TPBS um, it's something we should we should you know think about particularly if we can if there's alternative ways of doing it. whether that's splitting years or looking at the tax impact I think that's got to be a consideration when we think about the board has voted and endorsed unanimously this idea that this this building, you know, is is, is not going to last. We've, we've got to come to a we've got to come to a proposal to, and, and what we've said is we're we're ex we're actively examining our ability to build a new middle high school. That's going to require a bond. So I would be concerned about the, the approach to the funding of TPBS the remediation. But doesn't I go back to the question earlier about can you split it up? Right, split the cost up over multiple years. And if you're, we did the math here back in the envelope, it's $6 million to build that middle school slug, right? Mm -hmm. If we can knock that off the cost of a bond and split up $600,000 over two years, to your point, you're not necessarily inducing bond fatigue. And in fact, you're lowering the cost of that bond for the residents across the district. But you're raising the cost per year. But you're not though. You if you can you have three hundred thousand dollars if it's saying six hundred thousand and you're saying to go three hundred thousand per year, so then you're gonna approve in a budget to move forward with um, three hundred thousand dollars. So next March, the the first Tuesday in March, you'll be voting for three hundred thousand dollars to do X work. Okay. But you're gonna spend a hundred and thirty to Unless you're just going to no, no, build what, the building, let but it we're, we're talking about the six hundred. You're talking about the six hundred thousand. Let's forget about the one thirty. Let's not but go. But you have to do something, right? Well, we'll say the six hundred thousand. So what you're asking is to take three hundred thousand dollars and get it approved in the next budget cycle. So then we only have. Then we can only do half the work that year. And you want to get the school open. I understand. I hear you. And I'm saying put it forward for a vote right away. But if you only s approve three hundred thousand, you can only do three hundred thousand dollars worth of work that following year. And then you have to go ask for another three hundred thousand dollars. Okay, the following year. So you're sale. shutting your school down for another three years. But then roll that into the bond that's down five point seven million dollars lower. Yeah. I don't think I'm so I, I think that, that, that our committee, you know, is that's that's something that we've talked about. We're going to get the report from Mary Beth here in about 10, 10 days um, of the administration's feelings. But we have, you know, toyed with all these. Th there's going to be lots of different ideas, but I do think that figuring out, um, you know, what the recommendation is for the buildings and usages are different, or maybe it's three different scenarios. I have no idea what that is is important, and then. Um, if I'm <coughs> hearing you right, you're saying just potentially spend 130000 take those first steps, right? Maybe not with the bond, maybe with the bond, whatever, but then roll the rest of it into a bond or something. So, I mean, I think those types of scenarios is what we're going to have to flesh out after we, we then have this conversation. And that committee isn't, I mean, Bob and I co-chair it, but <coughs> it's a lot of community members and... Uh, Placement-wise, location in the next meeting? We're going to come to Pomfret. It will be in Pomfret. So, I, I mean, I think if we encourage people to come, but, but I think there's, we've had around 20 people on these couple of committees and subcommittees and definitely willing to, you know, and open to hearing that feedback. But, you know, it's a point well taken. So, Joe, I have one last question for you. Sure. So, there's how many elementary schools in our district? There's 
there's a few. There's writing. Hmm. <laughs> Honor. Oh. Right. Five. Six. Five. There's five. So we're talking about the needs of one elementary school and talking about a bond overload or whatever with the middle school, high school proposal also. Um, if we're going to go there, then what are the needs of the other four elementary schools also then? I mean, if we're, if we're concerned about that, then that's, you know, and I think, Bob, you brought that that's up. That's the part of what the committee is yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. whole thing. So the, bo the like bond may be seven or eight million dollars that you're talking about, and it may be to do all the schools. I don't know. I haven't been to one of your meetings. To the point that was made earlier, it's going to be hard when you have all these individual bond items or different repairs that are done at schools, especially when you have seven towns voting on these things. So if if we, you know, one idea that we had was, was if we could get all these things that are, that are needed at all the schools um, into one bond that's going to vote in those seven towns, and everybody is gaining something. Not only is everybody gaining something at the middle high school level, but also at their individual elementary school level. and you know that's that's definitely one thing we've talked about that's what i mean by different scenarios but i think we need all these figures and the different concepts that are out there all in one place with this group of 20 minds or whatever to, to hash that out but um that, that's true there's things at every every building and joe's sure, given us some reporting on that been 20 plus years of deferred maintenance on all those buildings <coughs> they're all do you have a number on that it'd be millions I, i'd be but i can't um, but I, i'd like to conclude this conversation um, <laughs> Because now I, we're getting can I just into make one comment? Weeds. Yes, Pat. I'm sorry. Um, I I appreciate you know trying to put all of this together all makes sense, but this was a commitment to this process. And I to the woman's question earlier about the, the timeline. The longer we delay this, it becomes a um, a death nail to that community. It does because. People's families have been in the other school for how many years? For some people, it becomes a matter of convenience in terms of the friends they know and the patterns they've developed. And I just, um, I don't want this tacked on to something bigger and larger because it's more convenient at, at the expense only of this community. And it's not just, um, it's not just to, to win and get what, what we want, and because let's face it, in the past couple of weeks, I've been told there won't be room in the budget to hire teachers to put kids back in that school. I was told flat out that. So, you know, I, I don't know what the plan is going to be, and I look forward to hearing it on the 19th, but the longer we delay this, the less likely it is we're going to be able to rebuild that community the way that it was to sustain that school under our sustainability policies and I and I, I really um, am uncomfortable with you know the timeline just getting bumped out bumped out bumped out let's make a decision and if we're good and you know what and if you guys don't want to keep this school take it back to the voters of Pomfret and go by mm -hmm. the way that you know Act 46 was originally written you well, know make, make a decision and and either move forward or take it to the voters a conference, said, and then you can be done. We have now listened to everybody's comments, and we understand what we need to look at, which is, one, what are the needs of the whole district for our buildings? It's just a fact. Um, two, that there is great value in the Prosper Valley school and building, and we don't want to necessarily lose that building because of another building, per se because there is such good value with that piece of property and, and the school itself, period. Um, we also have to look at the financial ramifications of how does that affect our taxpayers as well. So Mary Beth, Jennifer, myself, Richard, and our new finance director this week um, are going to be sitting down to talk about this conversation that we've had tonight to prepare for Mary Beth's presentation to both the campus configurations team so that you guys can start that process mm -hmm. as well as to the full board. Because we need to, as you said, Patty, continue the conversation but and, and come to a decision one way or the other, period. Um, I agree with you there. So we have some work to do now. Um, to get that presentation ready 
both on the financial side and the educational and the building needs side. We have to hit all three components. We can't just hit one or the other and sacrifice something because something else is coming down the road. We have to look at this building as being an incredibly valuable piece of property for our entire district as a whole. It's not just for Pomfret because we are now an entire district. How does this property complement our entire district and all of our properties? I move the question, move the aisle. Okay. E. Here Seven we go. Um, potential Barner merger update. Richard, thank you everybody for your questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. 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 Thank you,
in effect voting on the articles of agreement. I don't know the answer to that. This is a clarification. I, I, I just wanted to add to the, I well, can, I can wait. I think keep in mind that the articles of agreement support the policies that we have voted on and put into place. So we're not changing any artis articles of agreement strictly for Barnard. No, that's They're not what being I mean. updated. No, because people are having questions right now. Oh. They're strictly being updated to back the policies yeah. that have been now <laughs> written and voted upon by the board. This all started in policy. That, so yeah. For those that haven't been, this all started in policy and Pam has brought up and Lou has been there. And there are certain policies that we have. That's that's it. And we're trying to get the articles of agreement to and agree to the policy. Fact, the, the only articles that we had suggested go were just simply practical, like the beginning of the merged district, that kind of thing. Like things that already happened, or this must be done by 2017. Like but we haven't seen them, so I was that's Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I understand. But I just wanted to add a little bit about Barnard's side. Um, what we're doing, the, the sort of procedural things that Richard had mentioned. Uh, we had a, uh, we were scheduled to present a merger proposal to the SBE on the 18th, um, but we had to postpone that to October 18th because um, apparently you have to give them the uh, proposal two weeks in advance, and there was, that's now, that was like a few days ago. And we weren't, because we hadn't finished this conversation, we weren't able to do that, but that's, that's still fine within the timeline. Um, we're having a, um, two public feedback sessions. One's Wednesday at Barnard Academy at 6 o'clock. Um, the other one will be in mid-October. We haven't scheduled it yet. And um, we were told by Donna Russo-Savage that at the AOE that uh, late October <coughs> or even in as late as mid-November would be fine. Um, for a timeline for a vote, so that's where mm -hmm. we're at. Jennifer, so I, um, Thank you. thinking yeah. about this from a budget point of view and having a new, inexperienced um, <coughs> finance director, mm -hmm. I look at this last paragraph where it says, you know, the new finance director will prepare two budgets, one that will be a combined budget and one that's going to be a, a standalone budget. and. And walk me through what's the what's the um, what's the reason for not you know Barnard's going to vote and, and going to tell us all publicly you know if they want to join us or not. Why are we waiting till March? Is it is there an ex like a big expense or ordeal in having a? I'm just trying I mean, to like there that is seems an like a lot of work to do two different things. You know, you I'm sorry. Your, there is an expense of going through a vote. Yeah, we're already voting on March or in March for the budget for 2021. Could we have another one before there? You have 30 days following the vote by Barnard, 30 days re reconsideration. Re re reconsideration. Yeah. Thank you. So we'd be looking in the Christmas time. No, or I maybe think you're going to have trouble getting people to show <coughs> And we may, we may. So when I talk about a contingent vote, if for some reason there's a decision that Barnard shouldn't be allowed in, they need to vote on their budget and the others need to vote on a budget separate from Barnard. It's not that complex <coughs> to work with Mike and in, 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 in order to be able to get this put together. Okay. It's more work, but it's not something we can't overcome. Okay. Barnard's going to be voting on a bu Barnard is going to be putting a budget together for the elementary school, so that will be one budget. Right. And then we'll have ours anyway. And then we'll have ours <coughs> anyway. And then it's not that hard to say, overlap it and say this is with them in it. That's all. Basically. It's not a lot of work. N as I said. Yeah. I don't have to do it, so I'm just <laughs> 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 I, mean, I, I actually don't yeah, either, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I, was I, I was talking with Mike I today. Not yeah. no, he's, he'll, he'll be able to get it done. He really will. I, uh, that's, that's not the hardest part of this. Okay. Okay, can I have a motion on the table to adopt one, two, and three, please, for policies? So moved. Mm. Can I have a second? Second. So. Okay, I'd like to discuss one of them. Oh, Lordy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Actually, it's really simple. Okay. okay. Um, the, Go. the first one, district grade reorganization. First, first of all, there's a typo. Okay. Uh, one sentence is not supposed to be in there. Um, the title of it has changed, and I don't know who changed it or how, so that's weird. And then lastly, this actually um, is one of the things that 
Barnard is discussing with the, the council about the whole Barnard merger, um, something in this policy. And so I would ask if we could table this one until that conversation is complete. Can, can you highlight this? Uh, can, can, highlight? Can you further explain exactly what you're, what, why you need the delay and what language? Yeah, okay. what's the language that's concerning? Uh, if there's nothing actually, okay, so in the first paragraph, the second to last sentence, um, to maintain equity grade reconfiguration changes made on the basis of educational aim shall affect all students in affected grades equally. Um, there have been concern um, originally from Mary Beth that that might limit flexibility. Um, and so we had decided to remove that one, but we were still concerned in Barnard, and specifically me being one, serving both those roles, Barnard and, and this board, um, with that, um, that's not having that there took away a protection that we were, and I know Barnard voters are very concerned about, um, making it too easy to use uh, resources from one school to do something completely unrelated. Um, so this sentence that we had come up with that should be here um, is that last sentence. That is, so the typo is the second to last sentence and the last sentence is the one that's supposed to be here. Um, the we um, got together, Corinne and I got together this weekend and came up with a different sentence that would be additional, that would um, address that concern that we feel is now not being addressed um, in this policy and we would hope that um, this board would be open to listening to that. I don't remember the sentence off the top of my head but it does address um, that concern that, um, you know, um, and it especially comes from the, one of the ideas in the Act 46 study committee's plan or report or whatever, whatever it was called, um, that uh, because Reading and Barnard were the smallest schools, um, that they could be restructured and that money could go to pay for programming for specials for all students. So, we um, felt, am I going on too long? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. sorry. But we have to remember that the policy is being written for the entire district, not just Barnard or any other individual schools. And I, I honestly, I don't know how everybody else feels on the board, but I would push this forward as being approved. I, I think we start getting into trouble when we start designing a policy to fit a particular school district only. Um, and I don't know about Mary Beth, but do you feel that this is unjustly the one serves? Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, if Pam is right, the sentence the, that's <laughs> second to last <laughs> sentence was <coughs> taken <coughs> out and replaced with the last sentence, so yes. that is a change. Mm -hmm. um, and what about the title of it? What, what did you think the title was? I, I think, I mean, I'd have to look it up. I think it was, uh, restructuring or grade reconfiguration not reorganization I mean I'm not sure that really matters I just find it strange and notable and we should probably stick to what we had approved in the past yeah, which was reconfiguration I believe so that was the first reading we, had. we can look it up so um, what I did was I went into the last time we discussed these policies where the motion was made to move the policies forward for approval. I took the policies out of that book, moved them into this book, but if there are changes that were made that aren't recorded in this policy, I am not comfortable with you adopting them until we've been able to fully research that these are the copies that are supposed to be in this book. We okay. had uh, either the first or the second reading, we had lengthy conversations yes. about that got quite heated at times with recommended edits and removals. And I think what's coming up is that yeah, not everybody was Thank here because as it was June, yeah. July. I, I don't yeah. think you were there. I wasn't, but I received the draft after that. And so that's how so, I know that So why don't I make, make this recommendation is that we adopt school closure policy and campus sustainability policy 
as is, and that at our next meeting we we will look into these verbal changes that were either supposed to be made or not made so that this is precise and up to date based on our conversations. I, I just really want to say something very important. What I am suggesting is not to change policy for one school. I'm talking about something that is in policy that is fair for everybody. That's good policy and that would benefit everybody and I think it's good policy and I would want to you know recommend that Barnard joins a you know an but organization it's up with good to policy. The full board to decide if they want to vote on those kind of changes or not or around what they send forward to be adopted. It is, it is up to the full board to decide uh, of that. Of course I'm just making that recommendation on the basis of fairness not to say this is Barnard's thing. I think that's important to distinguish. Sam? Um, Heidi brought up a really good point about what did the meeting say from the last time and it says grade reorganization on the last meetings not reconfiguration and then it says basically like the same conversation we're having right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, motion to warn, moved by Jim, second by Pamela. Pamela discussed the changes of the name. Um, yes, I did. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it says right here. <laughs> Pamela discussed the changes of the name of the policy, wording of changes for clarity, and wor like literally this exact conversation. <laughs> yeah, I was just right. thought I would bring that up. That we're seems so like we're having the same conversation again. We'll well, so. But if you look at the meeting before, it does say great configuration. Oh, it does. Yeah, yeah I didn't even does. go that far the back. I just went to the last one. Great so. <laughs> we will we we'll will fix it. We will re we will research all of our notes and we will fix it the way that it was. Correct. Yeah. So do I yeah, have um, so you have to change the motion. Thank you. Jim wants to. Where do you go? Jim's not here. Who's <laughs> our seconder? Mm -hmm. I'm so I'm confused. <laughs> we have to, we have to amend what the motion to two. only adopt oh, two. two and three. Jim, can I have I'll you amend? Uh, I'll amend my motion to only adopt two and three. <laughs> Thank you. Can I have that second? Second. second. Well, the other person you. has to say yes, too. Blue does. He's accepted. Yes. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. All those in favor of the motion on the table say aye. 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 All those opposed? Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we just wanted to make a notification that there was an amendment to the grading process, uh, policy. We do not have to re-vote on it. We just have to make you aware of it. Mary Beth? Yeah, and um, Jim and Pam, or Lou, feel free to jump in here as well. Um, given some of the, we, we found a, a challenge in our software system, so we, we, we actually went further in terms of all grades and a 4.0. GPA, the, the content really hasn't changed um, other than you'll now see grades um, and no numbers in the um, report card. So it, it goes a little bit further in terms of <coughs> not having a, say, like a 3.7 shopping in credit card, it would be a B plus. Um, so it was a, a, a small tweak um, due to some software issues. Um, but the parents will continue to see grade, grades on the report card. Um, they're based on a 4.0 scale. Transcript is a 4.0 GPA. And we had to tweak the language given some of the adjustments we had to make in the software system. So that that yeah, that's, that's all great. And we've got a lot of crossing out here. And I just would like to point out in the first sentence is that, you know, it really should say, uh, Woodstock Union Middle School High School will be using a hybrid system that, that unites proficiency learning with traditional grading. You know, the main thing is is that we, we have here a hybrid grading system. It's actually a hybrid learning, the hybrid system that incorporates the proficiency learning with the traditional 4.0 grading. Correct, Aaron? Would you say that's fair? Yeah. So. I mean, I mean, it, it goes further on and actually explains it that way. It, it's telling us what we're doing here. The system will incorporate elements of proficiency learning, such as standards-based and everything else. And it goes on later on. It says, over time with the traditional four-point grading system. 
So I would just like to strike out, since we already struck out a lot of words here, I mean, I'm just looking for that grading to come out and we'll use a hybrid system that unites proficiency learning with traditional grading. It is kind of redundant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question, Garen. What you handed us, this grading policies and procedures, why is that not um, the same as what we're seeing here? The reason it's not the same, and so, and that's why we didn't put it out to parent test. We need to have a working copy. We thought that the language wasn't <coughs> substantive changes in that policy, so that's we'll do the updates once the board makes once, it. Once okay, so yeah. then it will be approved. right. Okay. So Jim, if I can just confirm, what you're looking for is we'll use a hybrid <coughs> slash out grading. So hybrid. We're system. using a hybrid system that unites proficiency learning with traditional grading. I think that administration has clearly made it. Um, it's clear, it made it clear to us that they have been able to um, align the grading systems for us to use a, a traditional grading system. I think that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Good. Do I have a motion on the table to adjourn? So moved. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.